Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here My sculpting up an image to play this is my last letter, and here's the last thing I'll say. Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Shumacast. I am Noel. Joining me, as always, is Angie. Hey, everybody. Our last episode was not really the start of the 90s era of Joel Schumacher, which is a little fun little nugget. But ushering in the actual beginning of Joel Schumacher's stretch of films through the 90s, which is, again, going to last us a year, if not more, is Melissa Kircher. Hi. Welcome back. No, thank you. <laughs> it's good to be back. It's your second appearance, but for your first Joel Schumacher movie on the show. Yeah. I'm so excited. <laughs> and it doesn't involve Eric Roberts. I'm really excited. <laughs> And yet it has a Roberts. It does. <laughs> it does. It's a better Roberts. It's a better Roberts. It's connected. <laughs> I just realized, what's the name of his daughter? Emma? Emma, yeah. She's going to be in one of Joel Schumacher's last movies. Oh, oh that's my. even better. So, hey, we get the Roberts trifecta in this series. <laughs> Holy cow. <laughs> Though I don't think you're on for that one, Melissa. I don't think I am. Well, you never know. We got time. So this is our first actual Joel Schumacher movie to have you on for. And I know in the last episode, we asked you for Slow Burn, what were your overall thoughts on Joel Schumacher? Have you had any other Joel Schumacher experiences or thoughts or revelations <laughs> since then? <laughs> no, no, nothing new. It was fun to revisit Flatliners because mm. I have not seen this movie since it was in the theaters, mm. which means I would have been 15-ish mm. uh, at the time. I think I was on a date with some. Somebody. And yeah, it's interesting revisiting that. I have many thoughts. I would have been eight. <laughs> ah, you're so young. <laughs> Nine for me. <laughs> for this episode was my first time seeing it. Oh, wow. And Angie, had you ever seen it before? I had not seen it before either. I knew it existed, but that was about it. <laughs> It was one I had heard about, but yeah. I had no associations with it, and it wasn't until we started doing this series that I even knew it was tied to Joel Schumacher. Yeah, I don't know that. I don't think I... Definitely not back then, I didn't know. I think when a remake came out, I kind of heard some stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, heard him mentioned, and that was about it. This movie is Schumacher's so hard. I just <laughs> recently... Re well, I mean, you were in the room for watching Lost Boys yes. with me, and then mm. that was the first time I'd seen Lost Boys in a long time. And rewatching Lost Boys and rewatching this within the last couple months, it's like, oh, 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 oh <laughs> I remember this era of American filmmaking. And, oh, boy, it was glorious. This is kind of an interesting era where his 80s was coming to a close. He had Lost Boys and then Cousins. <laughs> then he had two major massive projects that both fell apart. Mm -hmm. The first was he had already started working on a film adaptation of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Phantom of the Opera. Oh, boy. Which was supposed to be his next movie after Cousins. Wow. And then Andrew Lloyd Webber and Sarah Brightman got into a divorce mm. and basically drug the entire Andrew Lloyd Webber estate into the courts and tied everything up for several years in terms of settling who got what. Mm. So Phantom of the Opera was shelved for a while. We'll probably get into more of that history when we actually get to the Phantom of the Opera episode, but that's like something <laughs> that throughout the 90s, it kept popping up and then never happening and then popping up and then never happening Okay. until it finally happened. And I'm sure we'll have things to say about how it happened. I haven't seen it yet. We'll get there. Me either. And then also Joel had spent about a year developing Lost Boys 2 <laughs> with Jeffrey Boehm, the writer. And again, we'll be covering that screenplay later on in, in another episode. Suffice it to say, the first film still was not a very big theatrical hit. So the studio wanted it on a lower budget. They could never quite agree on how to settle that. So it just never happened. And then out of nowhere, this script plopped into Joel Schumacher's lap. He read it. He loved it. He wanted everything to do with it. And <laughs> it happened. The film was the first original script by Peter Filardi. It led to a massive work by him, which was a season three episode of MacGyver. <laughs> It's like all the work he got out of it while it languished on a shelf for years. Hmm. After this film, he then wrote another seminal young adult 90s classic called The Craft. Mm. Oh my god. <laughs> so the same guy wrote Flatliners and The Craft. Interesting. <laughs> 
and then got to write and direct his own indie drama, a teen Satanism drama called Ricky Six. <laughs> All right. So, Melissa, this is the second episode we've had you on for that involves Satanism. Yes! <laughs> Hail Satan. And sadly, otherwise, he hasn't really had much else. I'm sure he's the typical screenwriter story of he's probably had dozens of scripts that never got made, but the only other things he wrote were two Stephen King adaptations. He wrote the 2004 miniseries adaptation of Salem's Lot. Okay. Which I know, Angie, you weren't hugely fond of. I actually quite enjoyed it. Yeah. It was mostly just because it was in 2004. Eh. They couldn't resist making it about the war and everything. Yeah. That was like, you know. It's a loose adaptation, but I like it too. It just dated it a little. And then he did one of the Nightmares and Dreamscape sequences, The Road Virus Heads North. Oh, okay. And otherwise, he hasn't written anymore. He's produced a couple movies. He did one that looks really interesting. He produced a movie called Freezer, which is literally Dermot Mulroney <laughs> locked in a freezer for 90 minutes. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. Okay. <laughs> He's locked in there by the Russian mob who wants their money back. <laughs> and he either needs to escape or freeze to death. Wow. Wow. Freezer, Dermot Mulroney. And then he also produced Lucky McKee's thriller Blood Money. Excellent. Flatliners was produced as the first in a three-picture deal that Columbia Pictures had with Michael Douglas and Rick Bieber, the other two being Radio Flyer and Made in America. Hmm. And if one of those producers' names sounds familiar, that's because Rick Bieber also produced Stone Cold. Of course. And then that Michael Douglas person, I think he just did a few other films and did some occasional <laughs> acting on the side. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I think I've heard of that guy. But anyways, the relationship that Michael Douglas and Joel Schumacher formed here ultimately led to Falling Down, which we'll be getting to okay. in four episodes. <laughs> and Michael Douglas, of course, aside from his acting, had actually had a really strong name as a producer. One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, China Syndrome, Starman. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, I don't have much else on the production history of this film. We got plenty of crew members to talk about, but we'll say those for when we get into the open discussion. Medical student Nelson convinces some of his fellow classmates to help him with an experiment. They will make him legally dead for one minute before bringing him back to life so that he can describe what he sees on the other side. While there, he sees a vision of a memory of his past, but neglects to tell his colleagues about it. Joe, the jerk with a video camera who can't stop cheating on his fiance, volunteers to go next, staying under for a full two minutes of pure sexual imagery. David, the skeptic and atheist of the group, goes under and sees a vision of a girl he teased severely in high school. Good girl Rachel then takes her turn and relives her father's traumatic death. Steckle is also there for all of this, but never goes under, just makes a whole lot of snarky jokes all the time while talking into his tape recorder. Their visions persist even once they are brought back from death. Nelson is actually physically attacked by Billy, a young boy he teased in his youth. Joe hallucinates that all the women he slept with are torturing him on every video screen he sees. The visions get worse, and David decides to visit the girl he teased in school and make amends with her as a way to make it stop. It seems to work for him. Joe doesn't get the chance to even try, as his fiancé stops in and sees evidence of the many sex tapes he's collected and rightly dumps his ass. Rachel has a touching moment where she realizes her father was addicted to drugs, and the two of them embrace and she accepts what happened to him. Nelson, however, is not so lucky. It turns out the memory he's reliving actually led to Billy's death, as well as the severe injury of his dog. He went to a correctional school as a child, and he's still not able to forgive himself for the accident. He decides the only way he can possibly correct it is to put himself under yet again and ask Billy for forgiveness. He does so without any of the others, and when they arrive, they realize he's been out for nearly ten minutes. They fight to revive him, and all seems lost while Nelson relives the memory, but with himself the victim this time. He apologizes, and Billy and the dog seem to accept his apology, therefore allowing him to return to the land of the living, having made peace with it all. So Angie, do you recommend Flatliners? I do. It's not without a couple issues for me. Pacing, it just feels like occasionally it's taking a little while to get to the point. But it's a really interesting concept. I like the cast for the most part, even though not all of their characters are immensely likable. And it was just a really interesting movie. I enjoyed watching it and seeing where it was going to end up. Melissa, do you recommend Flatliners? I do. I think it's a fun movie. Oh boy, it styles so hard. It's so stylish. Mm -hmm. It is so ridiculously style over substance. I kind of love it just for that. 
I like the concept a lot. I kind of like the playing with the life after death concept, but it doesn't really go into issues of religion. I mean, it kind of glances around that stuff a little bit, like acknowledges it's there, but it takes this kind of skeptical scientific stance towards it. Yeah, I like it. It's not perfect, that's for sure. And I spend a lot of this revisit going, oh my God, <laughs> you don't place a defibrillator like that. <laughs> but, and, oh my God, this is the worst lit medical school I've ever seen. <laughs> but it's kind of fun on that level too. And also this whole movie centers around five actors and they certainly all went on well, William Baldwin, not so much, but otherwise you've got Oliver Platt, Wait, Kiefer four out Sutherland. Of five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, four out of five ain't bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. Kiefer Sutherland, I, I love Oliver Platt so much. Not necessarily in this, I just love Oliver Platt. And Kevin Bacon. Mm -hmm. Bacon! <laughs> and I recommend the film too. Most of my problems are on a script level. In that, mm -hmm. I think it's a killer premise. I just don't think it ever fully lives up to that premise. Yeah, yeah fair. But still, while I don't think the remainder of the movie lives up to that, I still think the remainder of the movie is not bad. It's interesting. It goes mm -hmm. down some interesting directions, raises up some interesting themes. And Joel directs the ever-living fuck out of it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, it's drenched in style, but I hesitate to say style over substance because there's still a lot of really nice character work. He's still doing a lot of really good narrative construction in terms of how he builds his scenes and how he puts everything oh, yeah. together. Everything visually flamboyant actually does service the story instead of just mm -hmm. being a distraction from it. <laughs> I have some real issues with the apartments that these students are living in. <laughs> But I think it's incredibly entertaining and watchable. And while it's not as philosophically deep as it could be, it is thought provoking. The cast is, for the most part, great. Mm -hmm. Again, it's like we brought up The Craft. I think it's very comparable to The Craft. The Craft isn't mm -hmm. a great movie, no. but it is a very iconic movie that a lot of people really enjoyed and really grabbed onto. And I can see yeah. a similarity mm -hmm. in that it's like it's scratching a lot of really interesting stuff. It never fully digs in, but it's interesting enough that it really does grab your attention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why don't we just go ahead and just start with that premise of medical students who decide to start killing themselves and resuscitating themselves to see what's beyond that? It was very interesting. And, you know, the way it starts out where it shows us Rachel talking to the group of a few different people, their near-death experiences. It made me think the film was definitely going to go in a different direction. You know, I expected to see some visions of heaven and hell and that kind of thing. But I really liked the fact that it went to their own personal hells instead. I actually found that a lot more interesting than potentially getting into a religion debate. It reminds me a lot of Jacob's Ladder in a lot of ways, mm. which is a movie I absolutely love. And also mm. not without its own flaws, but I like the premise a lot. I tapped onto it a little earlier where I kind of like the skeptical look at the life after death visions. I like how the film addresses that and then just uses it as a framework for a story. And I think it does quite a bit with it. And, you know, it's really a movie about absolution in a lot of ways, especially with the stuff that comes up with Baldwin's character. It's like, hmm, <laughs> some of that stuff's kind of lively today. What do you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Although one of the things the movie misses out on is, does Baldwin have to go and apologize to every single one of those women? That's actually a drop line from the screenplay. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, Where it's like they're racing to go save Nelson and, and he's talking to Kevin Bacon about trying to tell him how to fix this and he's like you mean I have to actually go and find everyone <laughs> <laughs> yes yes you do <laughs> hashtag me too motherfucker <laughs> yeah <laughs> I also really like that they set out to try to find out what's out there, what's beyond. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's a journey that ultimately pushes them inward. Mm -hmm. Even if we go from a purely scientific thing, a life after death moment, the brain shutting down all stuff. It's basically when you reboot the brain, your entire life flashes behind your eyes and you're forced to confront the things that you tried to bury. I do like yeah. the one scene in the film that makes it absolutely clear that this is not stuff actually manifesting in front of them. It's all in their head. Heads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like that it's a more personal journey. And I like how it's almost instead of being haunted by ghosts, these people who have died are now themselves ghosts with unfinished business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I find that really compelling. And my only issue is I do wish that they had been more philosophical. 
my biggest issue is they basically set out to, I'm going to have you go under and then we're going to analyze the experience that you had while you're under. And yet every Mm -hmm. single scene of them actually being like, okay, so what happened? The answer is always, well, it's hard to describe. And then they just say something vague. Right. They never actually talk about it, any of them. There's no actually like trying to map out the experiences, trying to compare and contrast to see what's different, what's similar. There's no actual Mm -hmm. science to how they're examining the experience. Well, that Mm -hmm. and first of all, I think that's probably just for the expediency of the audience. But second of all, Mm -hmm. a major plot point is the fact that they're not goddamn talking to each other. It's like, is weird stuff happening to you? That should have been the first fucking thing out of your mouth. (laughs) I'm starting to have visions in my waking life. That's odd. What do you think is going on? I'm a medical student. I should be asking these questions. No, it's... uh. (laughs) Yeah, it's like, what did you see? I don't know, a light and something was guiding me. No, you would say, I was in a field. I was running. There were trees in the distance. There was my dog. There were these other kids. There was something going on. It's like, as he's reciting it, you should almost see it clicking into his head that, oh, he's starting to remember something. And then you can see him pull back as he's starting to hide something. Right. Mm -hmm. Because he suddenly realizes where that train of thought's going. Yeah. You needed a moment like that, where it's like, if you're going to withhold something, we need to see why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you don't have the scientist actually like trying to analyze. That's what frustrates me the most about the story. They wanted so much to not reveal to us what it was Mm -hmm. that was bothering them so much that we didn't even get their perspective on it in a lot of ways because of that. I felt like, yeah, too much was hidden and took too long to reveal. Yeah. And I do like that everyone had their own experiences too. The Julia Roberts character is like, as a child, she wouldn't have realized what she saw. And so I can get that. She needs to go on this journey to be able to fully process what it was that she witnessed. Mm -hmm. You know, we see that with a lot of people who were, I hate to bring it up, but abused as children, where it's like they don't even Mm -hmm. quite realize what happened to them until reliving the experience fully allows them to process it. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. The Kevin Bacon character, of course, it's like, this is a person he hasn't seen since he was a little kid. It's such a buried memory and suddenly it comes flashing back to the present Mm -hmm. the William Baldwin character is a little different it's just montage of boob but (laughs) <laughs> and but <laughs> it's just i like women too much yeah. that's it <laughs> <sighs> i think it's a fascinating concept and the thing is i wish there was some way you could divorce that from the setup because i would love to see this setup used for a more intellectual philosophical medical drama mm-hmm. but i also don't mind the supernatural thriller that we get because it's a well-made one it's a very thoughtful supernatural thriller again i like that it's not supernatural and that I mean I'm saying supernatural with air quotes it's played in a style of a supernatural thriller yeah but again it's very introspective they're not coming to kill us you know it's literally mm-hmm. just your memories forcing you to remember them yeah and I like that And I think, again, Joel executes it very well. Mm -hmm. I think given a few extra years, you should just rewrite your own version of it and then pitch it to Hollywood. (laughs) I'm waiting for this. Well, we'll see how the remake does. Yeah. I am very curious to see how the remake handles it. By the way, listeners, that'll be the second half of this episode. We'll be recording it later. (laughs) We have not seen it yet, but we will talk about it. (laughs) Yeah. It was interesting because I was so intrigued by the concept that I started to try to dig around. It's like, has anyone else done a film like that? The closest mm-hmm. I could come up with were like Jacob's Ladder, Altered States, which again oh, yeah. is very interesting but has its own issues. Mm-hmm. Brainstorm. <laughs> I think Brainstorm was very interesting in the buildup of, again, similarly going to actually analyzing the fuller, broader repercussions, but then it kind of fumbled the ending. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But boy, Brainstorm is a trip, isn't it? I know. I watched it with you. I love that movie movie so much. (laughs) That's one where they actually do get into portraying heaven and hell, but do it in a very interesting way. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, another one that you could compare this to is like Strange Days, too, where it's like out-of-body experiences, what are the other broader complexities on us? I wanted a different movie than the one we got, even though I still enjoyed the movie we got. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like I can see the seeds for a much more intriguing movie, Yeah, but it's still a fun movie. Mm Mm-hmm. Why don't we just start knocking through the cast? One interesting thing that I just wanted to bring up, just rolling through all five of them really quick, is the ages. Julia Roberts was the youngest of 21. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Kiefer was 22. William Baldwin was 26. Oliver Platt was 29. And Kevin Bacon was the oldest at 31. I had a feeling he was older. I swear that man never ages, though. I mean, he's starting he to age yeah. now. 
I was even looking at where they were in their careers. And Kevin Bacon, you have to remember, he was acting since Animal House in 78. And he had already been oh, the mm-hmm. lead in Footloose and Quicksilver. And she's having a baby. Sure. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the studio tried to block him from being in this film because his last few movies had been bombs. Hmm. But what came out just a few months before this? Tremors. <laughs> <laughs> so Joel Schumacher won that fight. And then like Julia Roberts had only had small roles in Mystic Pizza and Steel Magnolias. Mm-hmm. And Pretty Woman had shot before this, but it hadn't been released yet. Okay. And then it did come out just a few months before. Kiefer Sutherland, you know, we talked about him in Lost Boys. Between mm-hmm. Lost Boys and this, he appeared in 10 movies, including oh, wow. Renegades, Bright Lights, Big City, and both of the Young Guns movies. Mm-hmm. He didn't stop. And in fact, Young Guns 2 was still in theaters at the time. <laughs> William Baldwin, this was only his third film. His only other roles had been tiny ones. And Oliver mm-hmm. Platt, this was only his fourth film. His prior films had only been small supporting roles in like Married to the Mob and Working Girl, mm-hmm. though he was already a very prominent off-Broadway actor and had already been collaborating for years with Hank Azaria and Stanley Tucci. Okay. Those three all came up together in the 70s. They went to school together. Anytime that Oliver Platt collaborates with Stanley Tucci, I'm all in. Mm-hmm. Just saying. So that's the core of where they all were in their career at times. So let's just start kind of knocking through them. Angie, what did you think about Nelson played by Kiefer Sutherland? During Lost Boys, I spoke a lot about Kiefer. This is yet again, he's not as charismatic in this one as he was in Lost Boys, but of course it's a different role. He's not meant to be as likable, I think, this time around. But he's still very interesting. He's handling, you know, a wide variety of emotions that he's going through and I don't necessarily buy him as a doctor, I have to admit. (laughs) More like a stump minister. Yeah. (laughs) But I mean, as a tortured soul, he plays the part very well. (laughs) Yeah, his bedside manner seems a little concerning. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) But yeah, when he's allowed to cut loose and go full Donald Sutherland and Kelly's heroes here. (laughs) When he goes full on bananas, it's intriguing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like the scenes where he's being attacked, I like how sympathetic they play it in terms of just how genuinely scared he is and just how Mm -hmm. the grind of just constantly being beaten down every time everyone sees him, he's all stitched up and bruised and bloodied. Mm -hmm. I like how he starts the film charismatic and is like the leading guiding force that leads down this thing. And then he gradually goes through this almost Ahab-like breakdown. Mm -hmm. My other issue with the script is I don't think the dialogue is the best. Yeah. 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 It's very quippy dialogue, but it's not sharply quippy dialogue. No. (laughs) And I don't like that character. He instantly rolls over on everybody else and blames them for wanting to go under and do the same thing. And, you know, just uh... the whole you're all riding my coattails thing. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And the whole like the jealousy of when David and Rachel start to bond. I'm kind of like, where is this coming from? Yeah. In the script, they played it up as more of a triangle, but yeah, it didn't really. It didn't yeah. work. Instead, it just reads that sexism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Especially when David's under and he's like mockingly delaying yeah. the resuscitation of, of Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like his portrayal of the breakdown. I think the writing could have been a little stronger. Mm-hmm. But again, I love all the scenes where he's being attacked by Billy because I love just how in the way they direct and edit those sequences, they make it so believable that this tiny kid is just beating the absolute shit out of him. Mm -hmm. And the resolution of one of the fights is just the kid spitting on him. Yeah. (laughs) So gross. "Ah!" (laughs) That is some serious foamy spit. Oh, Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, and in the script, it was he was doing that whole loogie thing of letting it drip down yeah, and pulling it back. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, it was just so gross to watch. I don't know. I don't like looking at people spit. <laughs> and by the way, that kid was the little boy from Harry and the Hendersons. No, really? <laughs> yeah, he only did a few things. He only had a handful of acting credits and then just, you know, went off and lived his life. And it's a shame because he was funny. a really expressive kid. He had mm. a really great look to him. But yeah, again, I love the style of a lot of those sequences. And Mm -hmm. again, like even the crawling champ, the dog that he keeps having the visions of. He he made me so sad. Yeah. That was the most distressing thing about this movie. Right? (laughs) For me was the, well, I've been, what, two and a half years now working with rescue dogs. I've got Mm. three of them now. And I'm like, no, (laughs) not a hurt dog. I literally wrote in my notes, I can't handle this. <laughs> no. Champ. The actor just look at it. It's just a dog that's trying to crawl on its belly, but they're adding the sound right. effects and the lighting. And <gasps> it's just, oh, they're milking it. Oh, yeah. Please hear Ghost Dog Baby come to me. I'll yeah. call help. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I love bits like where, you know, like he's hearing the sounds around him in his apartment and you know, he locks the door. He even like screws on this heavy duty lock and he's just sitting there with a screwdriver and Billy still always appears to beat the crap out of him. Mm-hmm. And yet he doesn't install any proper lighting in that goddamn apartment. <laughs> the only lighting in that apartment are blue fluorescent bulbs on the floor. It's all about the mood. If you want your apartment to be less creepy... <laughs> With its 20-foot ceilings. Get a floor lamp! <laughs> I'm still wondering how he afforded that apartment, because that was a massive well, apartment. All of them, right? Right? Well, Kevin Bacon was still living on campus. Kevin Bacon was sleeping on a pull-out couch, which I appreciate, but then there's this giant painting of a mountain behind him, right. which is like... I, uh, he hmm. might have painted it himself, you don't know. <laughs> Let's just go ahead and get into it. Angie, what did you just think about the whole visual style when it got so grandiose? It's definitely a very dark movie. I don't know. To me, it just fit the mood of the film so perfectly that even though it's not practical or realistic or anything like that, it just worked really, really well. And it helped put me in the right mindset for it. I liked it a lot. Melissa, I got to say, I want Joel Schumacher to do Mario Bava more often. Yes. <laughs> Well, I mean, this movie, Jan de Bont's so hard. Mm. So hard. <laughs> I mean, this is peak Jan de Bont. Jan de Bont, Jan de Bont. Well, but even Jan de Bont was more like yeah. slick, but still kind of more grounded, whereas Joel is the one who does the more operatic. He's been developing that style from St. Elmo's Fire to Lost Boys to this, and then it's going to culminate in Batman. Oh, I know that. <laughs> but putting Jan de Bont together with Joel Schumacher, it's like super de Bont. It's like they come together, form a Voltron of style, and it's so over the top, and it's glorious. Well, to throw in another name, Eugenio Zanetti. Yeah. The production designer of this was an Italian designer and director of theater and opera. His other films include Soap Dish, Last Action Hero, Tall Tale, Warriors of Virtue, The Haunting, Mm. and he won the Oscar for Art Direction of Restoration and was also nominated for What Dreams May Come. Mm, Okay. So it's the guy who did What Dreams May Come mixed with Jan de Bont, all under the supervision of Joel Schumacher. Yep. Gold. Yes. Yeah. Or rather, poof. orange. Lots and lots of orange. <laughs> Every time is sunset. Orange contrasted against blue with purple highlights. Yes. This movie is so <laughs> orange, except when it's blue. And there's one scene that's green. <laughs> Seriously, okay, who in their right minds would buy anything in a convenience store that is just green with like green steam rising from the floor? And I love Kevin Bacon's drinking orange juice straight off the shelf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What the hell is going on in this world? I love it, but what the hell is going on? (laughs) I've been to Chicago. It is not sunset 95% of the day. No. (laughs) It is always golden hour when it's daytime, and when it's not, it's blue. (laughs) And you have the heat and cold blanket, which is helpfully color-coded, so you know if it's cooling (laughs) or heating. I can guarantee that's not how that works. (laughs) It's wonderful. Well, now you know what Mr. Freeze's outfit is made out of. And this place that they're... Oh my god, oh my god. So the place that they're... My favorite bit is, quick, pull the table over the grate. I just got the boiler going. And the grate is literally this steaming thing with red fire underneath it. And it's like... (laughs) Yes! Why would you do anything medical? Wait, okay, 90% of the medical things happening in this movie should not be happening in those rooms. Why are you doing gross anatomy in this room with floor-to-ceiling oil paintings? Because that shit splatters. I mean... (laughs) And it's so poorly lit. Well, everyone is also covered in, like, Shroud of Turin death shrouds. Yeah. Medical corpses. I kind of appreciate that. I can almost accept that just given the subject matter of the movie because it's very evocative. Oh, I love it. I love it. Don't get me... (laughs) I mean, that's the thing. Again, it's like, while I would like to see a more buttoned-down scientific examination movie... If you're going to go supernatural thriller, go all in. Joel (laughs) Schumacher didn't just go all in. He pulled on goggles and and a hair protector and like floaties (laughs) and he just went up to the highest diving board he could and just right down into there. Yeah. And again, I love it because again, he's like going pure like Universal Monster and Mario Bava and Dario Argento. It's so heightened and yet (laughs) all of that does add to the mood and it does make it a mood piece. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And it's exciting and it's always servicing the moment and the emotions of the moment. And I love it. But again, it's a film that feels like it's trying to be two different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I do wish I had a heat lamp in every bathroom like it depicts in the movie. All of a sudden it's glowing red. Well, that's her memory. It looks so warm. I think one of the great ways to describe how they're using the style is the bit where Julia Roberts has the final confrontation with her father, where she's Mm -hmm. going into the bathroom. It's all lit and harsh red. It's this very tiny, cramped bathroom. And then as she finally realizes what it was she saw her father doing and finds it in her heart Mm -hmm. to finally, she understands him and forgives him. Mm -hmm. Not only do they pull into the embrace and the light changes to a much more natural color, but you actually physically see the walls of the bathroom separate Mm -hmm. and it becomes this wider, more open space. And it's so theatrical, but it's embracing how theatrical. That's the thing is it's not really campy because it's putting a lot of genuine thought into why it's Mm -hmm. doing what it's doing. Yeah. And again, I think that's a great evolution of like what he was doing stylistically with Lost Boys, where he was really experimenting Mm -hmm. with strong lighting and dissolves and montage and the camera work and just making it a very evocative mood piece. This is very much like that cranked up another notch. And then add into that Jan de Bont with handheld camera. Yeah. Mm. It's not shaky cam. It's a very smooth gliding camera, but it's always in the mm. moment. You're moving around buried right in the middle of the scene. It just really pulls you in. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's true. Although I was thinking about Lost Boys a lot during this movie to the point when Julia Roberts show up and I swear to God, the line in my head was, and starring as Jamie Gertz <laughs> is Julia Roberts. <laughs> but I'm very disappointed in the Halloween party that was outside. It even had the giant bonfire, but no oiled up sax guy. Here's the thing. I love the Halloween party, (laughs) but it makes me want Joel Schumacher to do an entire movie set at a Halloween party. I think we should write him a letter. You're just like, there's a killer at the (laughs) Halloween party who keeps killing people and switching costumes with them. (laughs) <laughs> dear dear Joel, this is the movie we want from you. So like dead people are turning up in costumes that are not what they came to the party in. And it's literally like he'll kill someone, take their costume, and then he'll go kill someone else and take their costume. And it's like this whole who done it when you don't even know who's under what mat. You know, it's this constant raging kegger of a outdoor bonfire Halloween party. <laughs> and the oiled up sax guy is there. Right? And Tim Capello. Yes. <laughs> Again, it makes me wonder what his Lost Boys 2 would have been like. Yeah. Right? Had he been able to take this evolution of that style and continued mm-hmm. exploring that universe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would have been all in for that. Yeah. So what all did you think about William Baldwin's montage of woman? <laughs> <laughs> I just, his character, and I understand, you know, you don't want everybody to just be like, oh, I, something horrible happened when I was a kid, but. He's so different than all the others, and he's such an asshole. He's exactly the Judd Nelson character from Phantom exactly. of Fire and the William Peterson character from Cousins. Exactly. The person who just perpetually cheats while waiting for someone to commit to him in the hopes that that'll cause him to stop cheating. Like, I'm starting to wonder, does this mean, like, <laughs> Schumacher had a little bit of trouble with commitment? Like, what is going on here that these characters keep coming back in his movies every time? I would actually say I think that's Joel's parody of straight male machismo. Maybe so. Oh, that'd be good. I mean, Joel, he sleeps around. From what I've heard, he's actually a very loving guy, and and he'll openly just date people and have flings. As long as you're honest about it, right. You can sleep with as many people as you want. But people usually end up breaking up with him on good terms, and he'll even stay in touch with them years later. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. Being an ethical slut, you know? Yes. All for it. All for it. By the way, I found on Twitter a guy who actually came to Hollywood, worked on a soap opera for two years and dated Joel Schumacher for two months and he said he loved it. (laughs) (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Awesome. Again, I attribute it to more the mocking of the male ego. Sure. Makes sense. I like the comeuppance that comes with it. I love the scene where it's all the women throwing all the same pickup lines that he used on them. Yes. And he loses his fiance and he doesn't get her back. I like that aspect of it. He Mm -hmm, loses mm -hmm. the thing he wants most and he's got work to do. And that's where, again, I don't think he fits into the dynamic of the group that great, but he is an interesting Mm -hmm. character study unto himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My only problem is I don't think William Ball is a good actor. (laughs) No, he's not. No. As I put in my notes as soon as he showed up, Baldwin alert. Oh shit, which one is this? (laughs) (laughs) One of the blander ones. Yeah. Yeah. This also goes back to the dialogue issues where it's like, you know, they kill Nelson and they're all standing around and he's like, are you telling me we're in a room with a dead guy? 
It's like, really? Yeah. You, you, you've been in the room for like two minutes already. Well, and we already saw you like working on a cadaver. Yeah. And also, they bring him into this because he has a camera and can film the experience. But it's the shittiest, grainiest black and white <laughs> video camera that he keeps right? perpetually zooming in. So you can't make out any detail. It's the worst video camera. Mm. Well, video yeah. cameras back in 1990 weren't very good. We had a video camera in 1990. It was better than that. They were better than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe it's because he was a college student, or maybe it's just because that's the one that had the best low light performance. <laughs> That's like the type of camera that Vincent Gallo would fall in love with and make an entire movie with. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it would. In terms of the supernatural thriller aspect, I like that it is a very kind of Twilight Zone morality play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think his story is a bad one. And again, I think it pays off really well that they kind of left it on the floor that, oh, yeah, you'd actually have to go back and apologize to all his women because I want him to just be like, he's never kind of quite get over that. I almost wonder, his thing is not so much that a thing in the past affected him so much mm -hmm. as just the infatuations that he's had since he was a child are ruining his life now because of the choices that he's allowing himself to make. Well, it's not necessarily infatuations. It's he was filming these women without their consent. I mean, he yeah. was also cheating. But right. the big thing is, and his fiance even makes it clear. It's like, yeah. I could have handled the cheating, but you were filming them without their consent. Bye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but what I mean is his entire, what we get from that montage, because, you know, going from being born to the first breast to young girls to teenage girls to women, it's he just has this hyper sexualization of every woman he comes across. Mm -hmm. yeah. And his his entire life with all the pickup lines, all the constantly hitting and sleeping with everyone is this depersonalization of sexualizing every woman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that the story is ultimately forcing him to come to the consequences of this is what you lose when you don't respect that. That you've allowed yourself to go down this road. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, it's very pertinent to what's been going on these days. <laughs> yeah. So, Angie, what do you think about Julia Roberts' character? Julia Roberts is pretty much always likable. That certainly helps. But I do really like her character. I like that she's searching for these answers and trying to make peace with herself even before she mm -hmm. realizes exactly what it's going to do to her. She reminds me a lot of Beverly and It. Mm. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of parallels there. Uh, but no, I really liked her character. I like what they do with her character. I don't think she's given much of a character. Not that the guys have much of a character either, but mm -hmm. I like her search for meaning. I like that the film does bring up the issues of sexism with her being the token woman and mm -hmm. how she's being mm -hmm. kept away from this thing she wants to do by the guys who are also on this team. I like the issues that are brought up with her, although I wonder in the movie if that character's a woman just because they wanted to be able to do CPR without having man-on-man -man action. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't watching for that the whole movie, so there may have been early in the movie and I just didn't catch it. Knowing Joel, he probably filmed it and they pulled it out. But <laughs> was pulled out yeah, but that's <laughs> possibly true. That's but true. I did take a look at the DVD cover of the remake and it does look like there's more gender balance mm -hmm. in the main cast. Hopefully that takes mm -hmm. it in a different direction. Mm -hmm. But it's like, hmm, token woman, here's Julia Roberts. Yay. <laughs> what I like about her is there is this tightness to her performance because she's very focused on what she wants to know. She mm -hmm. has this quest to discover something, but she's really done with putting up with shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's like throughout the movie, people are still giving her shit. And the way she's reacting to it is like, you're giving me the exact same shit everyone's been giving me my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm afraid I wasn't clear on this. I think Julia Roberts is a fantastic actress, and mm -hmm. she is great with everything she is given to do here. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember when I first saw her in Steel Magnolias, and just seeing her performance early in the film, it's like, good lord, this woman can act the socks off everybody. She wasn't given a whole lot to chew on here, but she's great. She really is great. Mm -hmm. Even that moment with her father when she finally sees the needle. Oh, God, mm -hmm. she's amazing. She reacts, she looks away, and then is like, no, don't look away. You know, just takes it all in and finally accepts mm -hmm. it. It's a wonderful sequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just thinking, writing-wise, wouldn't it have made more sense for her to have been the one that started all this? Ooh, because she's the one That wanted this to happen? Yeah. You know, I think it needed to be Nelson because he's driven by ego. I think she should be a counterbalance to him. Okay. But I think it makes more sense for him to do something this audacious because he wants to be celebrated for being the first person to do it. Gotcha. Yeah. 
and I like the parts where she keeps being pushed out. Mm-hmm. Not that I like them. I like the mm-hmm. drama that that creates because it's sure. like, oh, shit, I've seen that happen before. I like that they acknowledge it, too. Yeah. 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 And the fact that it's acknowledged and dug into. and mm-hmm. Yeah. But I mean, it's like even the William Baldwin character is even still trying to hit on her, too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And by the way, with the prosthetic corpse on that table, this is our first penis in a Joel Schumacher movie. <laughs> I was wondering. It's only taken us 16 years to get there. <laughs> I don't even think I noticed the penis. Oh, it's underneath the Shroud of Turin. <laughs> when he pulls up the sheet and says, identify, and she says, your brains. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's a dick. Mm-hmm. Wow, I completely missed that. <laughs> <laughs> they block off the end of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. And it was pretty quick, too. You can totally see the male cleavage. You can kind of see. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. So that is our first penis. We'll have to see how many more we get in the road to come. <laughs> Batman's cod piece doesn't count. No. No. But also, you know, speaking of Batman, just how many gigantic statues are in this movie? <laughs> Well, it is Chicago. I mean, there's I a reason why they filmed the latest Batman movies in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. But I even love, like, in the abandoned, not not abandoned, but the museum that's going under renovations that they're doing this all mm-hmm. in, there's just mm-hmm. this gigantic top of a head just sitting in the <laughs> Yeah. 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 <laughs> why? <laughs> and even then, like, in the alleys, you get these giant neon graffiti monsters. Mm-hmm. And it's, oh. Oh, I love the neon graffiti monsters. I, I love, love that. That scene. Yeah. That's beautifully lit. And again, I love how much of the horror is achieved just through lighting and mm-hmm. lighting changes. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, speaking on a technical side, I should also mention this is the first Joel Schumacher film to be nominated for an Oscar. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. For sound editing. Yes. Hmm. Which, again, very good sound editing. It's the same guys who did Lost Boys, too. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I did notice a little bit of it. You know, they're playing with pushing and pulling between the sound of reality and bleeding the medical sounds mm-hmm. into some of the dream sequences. Dream sequences will have a lot of whooshing sounds. I really like the whooshing sounds in this one. <laughs> they were especially good whooshing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And even just like that last one where David zooms into him as he flatlines and that sound of the flatline fading into his vision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Angie, what did you think about the Kevin Bacon character? I liked him. I liked the intro scene we get to him where he's technically not a doctor yet, but he just wants to save that woman so bad. It's a hospital with black corridors and neon red (laughs) door frames. Yeah, who the hell lit this? Who lit this hospital? The best person ever. Oh my God. But no, I like the scene, but then it's kind of set up as a big deal and then it kind of goes nowhere. Like he just keeps hanging out anyway, which I guess is fine. It's not their quest to graduate is not the part of the movie. Well, again, they said that he's just basically being punished for a semester. Well, that's what Nelson assures him. He doesn't know that for sure. But no, he's an interesting thing because he's kind of the moral center while also being the atheist, which is not usually a common role you see in films. But I approve. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) He's the McCoy. He's the damn gym doctor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's the passionate one. Of He's passionate for saving lives. And, you know, it's Kevin Bacon, so. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Why does he have to repel out the window when he wants to leave the... (laughs) Yes. First. <laughs> Why the hell does that happen? he's a rebel. Happen? I don't know. Because he's a rebel because he can repel. Why does he have the crappiest giant military truck? I don't know. <laughs> Why Why is Woody Woodpecker on the window? <laughs> I have to say something about that military truck because, you know, talking about why are things lit that way and everything. It has the dirtiest windows. Yes, but <laughs> Nelson's being attacked in the back of the truck, right? Mm-hmm. Which has nothing but that vinyl fabric. He's got to break the window. Why does he smash the to get it? No. When you could just flip up the tarp. Just go <laughs> flip up the tarp. <laughs> to be fair, it's a tied down tarp. Oh, he could have undone oh, it. Oh, but that's right. But we saw Nelson notice the corner flap. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, it was just flipping up. Unless that was his vision. Oh, my God. <sighs> that was the silliest part to me. That was when I'm like, we need a little logic here, people. Come mm-hmm. on. <laughs> And I'm wondering what happens after that scene. Does the black family come running out of the house like, what the fuck are you white people doing? <laughs> Clean up this glass. There weren't horns blaring. They probably wouldn't have noticed. Uh, you hear glass they breaking. They were right outside the house. <laughs> what the hell? There were trees. There was shrubbery. They were in the back. Keeper Sutherland is screaming his head off in the canvas-covered, crappy-ass oh. military man. Kevin Bacon smashes a window to get at him. He's bleeding. The house is right there. 
what the hell happened after that scene? <laughs> That's something I want to see. So on a different track. <laughs> so, but Melissa, what did you think about that whole backstory with Winnie Hicks? I think it's a story that has gained relevance in recent years, and I really kind of like it. it. Going in and not just seeking absolution, but going back and saying, that was wrong and I'm sorry. And I like the line that Kiefer Sutherland has as Kevin Bacon's going into the house. I can't remember if it was like, he's got guts or he's got balls or whatever it is, but that's Mm -hmm. an incredibly brave thing to do to go in after all these years and apologize. And what I love is that it's not an apology where he's asking for forgiveness. He says his say and then he heads out and she chooses to forgive him. Yeah. The important Mm -hmm. thing is, I'm here. I'm sorry. That was wrong. Yeah. Done. I really like her reaction, too, of like, you can tell she's really like, I don't want to think about that time of my life. I've done my best to move on from that. And here you are forcing me to think about it again. Mm -hmm. But that ultimately she is appreciative that he is at least apologizing for it. But he's apologizing for that, too. I love it. Yeah. 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 I like that whole little arc. Mm -hmm. And again, that there is that racial undercurrent to it, because it's a very Mm -hmm. white movie and that's a black girl that he traumatized as a child. Mm-hmm. I do like the little girl that they found to portray her when she <laughs> shows up in the train and just the whole series of insults. Oh, yeah. that like two minute long string of invectives from this what eight year old kid. She Andrew Dice clayed him. Yes, it was amazing. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. Where did you find that kid? I know. And that's amazing. <laughs> also, shame on her parents for like immediately being like, oh yeah, here's my daughter's address. Go see her. It was a simpler time. (laughs) It's a simpler script. (laughs) No kidding. (laughs) From the writer of The Craft. (laughs) And a season three episode of MacGyver. (laughs) (laughs) And Dermot Mulroney locked in a freezer. (laughs) Or wait, no, Dylan McDermott. One of those two. (laughs) You really are good. I actually made the mistake. I made the classic mistake. You know, and I also love that it was one night from the abyss. I always loved her character in the abyss. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I thought it was really nice. And again, his journey is to make amends for something that he did wrong. Julia mm-hmm. Roberts is to become at peace with how she lost a loved one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kiefer is to come to terms with a life that he destroyed, someone that he can't really get an apology from. Mm-hmm. And then William Baldwin is to realize the lives that he's destroying in the quest of his own. I, I don't know. His is a little mm-hmm. foggier. Right. Yeah, it's comeuppance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, Melissa, what did you think about Oliver Platt's character in that he never gets to die? (laughs) Poor Oliver Platt. (laughs) And yet, lucky Oliver Platt. (laughs) The comic relief character? I love his line, if I had done this, I would probably be chased by my 300-pound babysitter for the half of a pastrami sandwich that I stole. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, what would his story be? Nobody buys his book. (laughs) Nobody buys his book. (laughs) But yeah, he's like the bard of the piece. It feels like he doesn't quite have enough to do aside from being the overblown writer character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of the comic relief, even though he's not given a whole lot of comic to do, which is unfortunate because Oliver Platt is so good at stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when he shows up in the first scene he's in, in that orange lit apartment with his little voice recorder trying to come up with titles, it's like, oh, 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 oh God, it's me. I'm sorry, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you know, again, that's where you could be where he almost evolves into the person who, because he's actually been recording things, is starting to put all pieces together and finding mm-hmm. comparisons and contrast, but they don't go that angle. No, no they totally no. don't. I mean, it's kind of a wasted character, mm-hmm. yep. to be honest. You could easily take him out and not really lose anything. Which is really too bad. Yeah. And he's giving the voice to the glory of, you know, we'll be famous, we're conquering the new frontier. But it's like they always find the worst places to drop that line in. And yeah. so much of that is already being expressed by the Nelson character that you don't really need both of them. Mm-hmm. Right. And again, there needed to be something more to his plot. Right. right. I would have almost merged him and the William Baldwin character together. Mm, Mm. Interesting. He's all about the glory and the conquest and all that stuff while he's also doing this whole thing, sleeping with all these women. And get rid of... No, no, no. 
You get rid of Baldwin, and then you have Oliver Platt play that character. <laughs> Fused in that aspect of also, he's the chronicler. Yeah. Yeah. You'll mix that yeah. with the camera. He's the one who's trying to create the record of this, but he's doing it in such an overblown way. You yeah. could easily just narrate over your video camera. You don't need a cassette tape to also do, yeah. right? And that would mean it's also Oliver Platt being constantly bombarded with images of Oliver Platt sex tapes. <laughs> <laughs> His character is missing something. The William Baldwin character is missing something. Mm. Hey, here's an option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Melissa, did you have a few things to say about the medical science in this film? <laughs> I mean, the one thing that I know is that defibrillator pads don't actually restart a stopped heart. They stop a heart that has gone into fibrillation so that it will jumpstart back into a regular pattern. Yeah. Yeah, so they're using them all wrong, and the placement is wrong, yeah. like 90% mm -hmm. of the time when it's shown. And at the end, when Julia Roberts is on the table, they're trying to like defibrillate her through her bra. That's not how that works. That would melt a wire. And it wouldn't work. <laughs> I mean, usually you see they squirt the gel on the pad, so you get good contact. That would have required Julia Roberts taking off her bra. I don't think she wanted to. I mean, I can Probably understand not, that yeah. part, but at least like position it right yeah. where you wouldn't be going across the bra anyway. Yeah. There was one of the drugs that they were injecting. It's like, no, you pull in the blood a little bit into the syringe and then go in. Oh, oh, one of the telling ones. At one point, and I can't remember where it is, they take a syringe and they squirt the liquid out first, then they tap it for bubbles. Mm. That's not how that goes. You tap it for bubbles first because you're trying to get the bubbles out of the syringe. So that's when right. you squeeze the stuff out. The pulling a little bit of blood out, I'm willing yeah. to give them just because they're not actually injected into an arm. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm willing to give that. And that, that's needles. like the finest of fucking details. But the bubbles in the squirting and it's like, mm, mm, -mm. Mm -hmm. My biggest thing is the entire premise of the movie is built around the flat line. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, this movie coined the term flat line. <laughs> okay. The thing is, if someone flatlines, the way to restart a stopped heart is to inject adrenaline straight into it, which will not restart it immediately, and then you have to do chest compressions to start pumping mm -hmm. it through the system. And then if okay. you start to get a pulse, then you can use a defibrillator paddle in order to try to mm. fully restabilize that pulse. However, successfully restarting a stopped heart happens in less than 2% of cases. Right. Sure. So the fact that everybody survives this movie. <laughs> and even then, defibrillation, if your heart has gone into fibrillation, where it's like your pulse is wildly off, or the two sides are beating in irregular patterns against each other, the defibrillator pedals will still, again, only work about 20% of the time. Yeah. Mm. They're kind of a method of last resort. Yeah. A lot of people do still die. Mm -hmm. Sure. With all the drugs that are being injected and the constant chest compressions and the defibrillators, they are doing so much damage to the bodies. <laughs> oh, God. Everybody's yeah. got broken ribs after this movie mm -hmm. because, I know. Oh, oh, the CPR posture that everybody has is awful. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the chest compressions. It's like, oh, God. Oh, God. Don't. No, no, no. That's not good. You'd have to press on the sternum, but it has to be straight down because you have to leverage yourself on the sternum to actually get to the heart. But the way to do heart compressions, your shoulders have to be straight over that sternum and your yeah. elbows have to be locked. None of this like jogging your elbows up and down or pressing mm -hmm. to the side of the table or anything like that, because that's, oh, it's not good. But even if you do them right, you're going to be breaking ribs. Part of that, I'm, again, I'm willing to forgive because they don't want to actually hurt their fellow actors. Yeah. I mean, sure. I don't think I've ever seen a movie. And also Julia Roberts is like, hey, minimize touching my boobs, please. Yeah, that's totally <laughs> fair. I mean, to be fair on the CPR position, I don't mm -hmm. think I've ever seen a movie get that right. The Abyss. Uh, the Abyss might be correct. I'll have to watch that. But the CPR thing irks me in movies because that's one of the things I'd like to see done right because that's something that people should be able to do yeah. if sure. they need to. That's like a life skill just about everybody should have just in case somebody drops in front of you. But it is also dangerous to do to someone who's, you know what I'm saying? So you can't right. really do it to an actor. Not enough people would do it right. Yeah, you can't really do who's it to alive, an actor, but you can always, so. eat, I mean, that's what special effects are for. You know, you just get yeah. one of those CPR dummies and you put the CPR dummy chest there and that's when you do the <laughs> chest compressions. That's what the word pantomime is for. Don't even need effects. You just act. Yeah. <laughs> And we know from the dissection room, they had plenty of rubber corpses. <laughs> yes, yeah. indeed. That is the most rubbery foot. 
<laughs> I cut oh, into by the foot. way, there was a re- the the foot that he cut into with the scalpel. Uh-huh. You'll notice mm-hmm. both him and Oliver Platt keep cutting into it. There was a bit from the script that they cut that they were actually playing a game of tic tac toe on it. Wow. <laughs> Okay, that I'd buy. But it's still the, a freaking rubbery foot. You can just see the whole thing flex weird, <laughs> like it's gelatin, rather than having bones or anything I, like that. I'm giving him a pass because most prosthetics in movies aren't meant to be shot that close up. Yeah, uh, yeah, I know. I mean, the makeup was good on it. I do have one question. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. What was the whole obsession with the body temperature and how that was supposed to stop brain damage? It's like if you fall into like a freezing river, the reason why uh-huh. you're able to be resuscitated is because you're... Your blood is cooled to the point where it stops the degeneration of brain tissue. Yeah. Okay. And it was kind of a hot thing in the news at the time, as I mm. recall, because I think it was in the late 80s. There was some kid who had drowned in a lake and had been mm. submerged for some absolutely obscene amount of time, and they pulled him out and revived him, and it was all because his body temperature had been cooled. Well, I mean, you remember okay. John Smith's backstory in Dead Zone? Yeah. Mm. I mean, that was yeah. something that was just starting to be understood in the late gotcha. 80s, as I recall. Okay from growing up and so I think it was fresh in everybody's minds I mean I don't think you know, the whole cooling blanket and thermal blanket quite work like they have here <laughs> <laughs> yeah it would take a long time to cool and heat everybody properly yeah and mm-hmm. you would cover the head too and I know that's another thing yeah. is like people who have severe head injuries now it's like instantly put on an ice helmet which is basically a frozen helmet which will help mm-hmm. lessen the swelling of the brain mm-hmm. gotcha I mean that's the other thing is they get into this whole thing about stopping the heart and everything but most of the experiences that they're having Having and that people have actually documented from you know, near-death experiences are mm-hmm. more oxygen deprivation to the brain. Sure. Yeah. Anytime you deprive the brain of oxygen, it's going to cause damage. Mm-hmm. Anytime. And that's why people who get into like autoerotic asphyxiation or strangulations to get high, they really become very sluggish very fast because every single time they do it, they're literally dissolving off parts of their brain and killing off parts of their brain. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. God, imagine a movie like this all built around a fetish group built around autoerotic oh, asphyxiation. I think there are some interesting angles you could take in this script like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, God, especially if you read up the history on like Von Bode and, and people like that. Yeah. Mm. There are people who strangle themselves because it gives them visions and it gives them serotonin releases and all that stuff. And it's like so much of what we're seeing of the near-death experiences don't even have anything to do with the heart. They have to do with oxygen to the brain. Sure. As the brain shuts down, your brain is literally just flashing through everything it can to try to keep itself awake. So that's why Mm -hmm. you're flashing through your memories. That's why you're seeing loved ones. That's why you're seeing the light. And that's why you're having all these feelings and emotions because your brain is literally squirting every gland it can in order to try to keep itself going because your brain is basically freaking out. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. Again, that's what I like is that this starts as a spirit quest, but it becomes a quest about Mm self-reflection. That's where I think putting more of a focus on what happens when you shut down the brain instead of shutting down the heart. Because the heart is just an engine. The heart's just a machine, you know, whereas the brain is such a complicated thing that when you mess with it, it will react in very complicated ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's where I get the catchy title of flatline. But flatline could also apply to brainwave patterns. And in fact, they did have brainwave machines that were reading off stuff too. Yeah, and the first scene, I think. Yeah. Again, that's where I think they get their science wrong. And again, the whole sure. defibrillator pad is such a cinematically exciting thing that everyone keeps getting yep. enticed by it. Oh, yeah. 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 And then I'm trying to think. Anything else, Melissa, that you can think of that you want to bring up on this movie? Um, No, I think we covered just about everything. Mm-hmm. How about you, Angie? Yeah, I think same for me. I think my silly nitpicks have all been discussed, so... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I did catch during some of the more exciting things. They had full Bollywood wind machines on Kevin Bacon's hair. Yes. And I did appreciate that. <laughs> it wasn't just on his hair, but his hair was the one that caught it the most. Right. Well, yeah. Well, his hair is so aerodynamic. His hair mm-hmm. is like a field of Terrence Malick grass. <laughs> <laughs> just gently waving. It's just, you know, sunset brown, swaying. In the- <laughs> Terrence Malick can make an entire film about Kevin Bacon's head. I'd be in for that. And it would be four <laughs> hours long. I'd be in for that. And have like post-production written letter narration. <laughs> and it would be 90% set yeah. at sunset for the golden hour. It'd be beautiful. <laughs> I just had a couple of the, just little quick credits to bring up. We mentioned Jan de Bont. I just wanted for our listeners just a little more clarification on who he is. Jan de Bont started as a cinematographer doing Paul Verhoeven films in Turkish Delight, Katie Tapel and the Fourth Man. And then when he came to Hollywood, he became one of the major cinematographers of the 80s with movies like Cujo, All the Right Moves, Clan of the Cave Bear, Ruthless People, and unfortunately Leonard Part 6. 
<laughs> but then it's like he became like with Tony Scott and all those other ones. He became one of the people who kind of ushered in action movies from the late 80s into the 90s as he became the cinematographer for Die Hard, Black Rain, Hunt for Red October and Basic Instinct. And it all culminated in 1994 when he made his directorial debut with Speed. Mm -hmm. And God, do I love his work in this. Yeah, he's amazing. Mm -hmm. And every time I watch Die Hard, I'm more and more struck by his cinematography than that because it's not as forward as this, but it's a gorgeous movie. Well, and again, like the stuff he did with, again, it's very energetic energetic, hyperkinetic style, but I think you're taking that and mixing it with Eugenio Zanetti, who's like a literal production designer of operas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Imagine if Joel had been able to take these two guys with him when he did Batman. Oh. <laughs> would it have a more finesse to the style than blah? Yeah. Well, it would, well, you'd think it would have to. It would have to, but boy, that wasn't the primary thing wrong with those oh, Batman no, movies. Oh, no, there's other things wrong. No. There are a lot of things wrong with those movies. But what's interesting is Joel doing all the same stuff he did here but without them yeah mm -hmm. and i'm wondering if that maybe affected it or if it just there were still other things batman forever maybe batman and robin i think still would be where it is yeah <laughs> there are so many things wrong with that movie yeah wow we'll get there and then also I want to mention Robert Brown, the editor of this. This was the third in a series of five films he did with Joel. He had also done Lost Boys and Cousins. And it's also worth mentioning, like, right before this, he also did the medical school drama Vital Signs. Oh, yeah. yeah. I vaguely remember that. And then the while we mentioned the production designer Eugenio Zanetti, the art director Jim Dultz not only collaborated with Eugenio on a bunch of films, but he was also the art director on Tank Girl. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And the Muppets Tonight TV series from the mid-90s. Oh, okay. Ooh. And was the production designer of Team America World Police. Yes! <laughs> And then this is the third of four Joel Schumacher films for costume designer Susan Becker, who had previously done St. Elmo's Fire and the Lost Boys, and also True Romance. Ooh. <laughs> so just any final thoughts on the movie? It's a really interesting film, and I'm glad this gave me a chance to finally watch it. Well, here's a question for you. Mm -hmm. What do you hope for from the remake? I'd like it to be a little bit tighter. I'd like the Steckle-like character to have a purpose, if he's going to be there at all. Less Joe. <laughs> 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 you know, like a couple little tweaks here and there, maybe a little bit more exploration of the visions and a little more variety to them. Yeah, I don't know. I'm optimistic. <laughs> I'm looking forward to seeing what they come up for techno babble because <laughs> there will be medical techno babble. I guarantee it. And I'm looking forward to see if they have different backstories to tell on their characters, if they mm. use the same dynamic of this person accidentally killed a kid and this person did this and this, if they have a different set of stories to tell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It'd be very interesting to me if they did that and mm. how that would change the story. Yeah. And for me, it's try to find a bit more balance between the philosophical underpinnings of that setup and mm -hmm. the morality tale supernatural thriller aspects. Mm -hmm. yeah. Try to find a way to make it more smarter. I mean, not that this movie is stupid, but something more intellectual, I want to say. Something more philosophical. Sure. Yeah. I mean, keep in mind, this movie is 30 years old now. Yeah. Medical science has come a long way. <laughs> there was an article about how they literally got someone to be able to read another person's thoughts by plugging their brains together. That's ah. literally the opening scene of Brainstorm literally just happened in a lab. <laughs> 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 So, yeah, it would be interesting to see where we go from here. And there's a few things I know about the remake, but I won't spoil you guys for it. Okay. okay. So, just to get into the box office and release of this film, I'm finding contradictory things. I found an article written by the production manager where he said this movie only cost $15.6 to make, but other places say it was more like $26 million. Ooh. I don't know which of those is more true. 26 seems a little high for even 1990, especially given that so much of the film is just done with like lighting and editing and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah this does not look like a high budget movie. I mean, it's essentially five actors yeah. and a few extras, and that's about it. And these are actors who, while Kevin Bacon and Kiefer had the highest stardom, like Julia Roberts had not taken off by this point, mm -hmm. you know, Oliver mm -hmm. Platt was who? Okay, Oliver Platt's never been a box office sell because most people are stupid. That's true. <laughs> again, Kevin Bacon was coming out of a slump, so it's like no one was like a major, all the money's going to that person's salary. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So the film opened on August 10th, 1990, and this is Joel's first number one release. Wow. Because okay. we mentioned in our run through the 80s, Joel never had a movie open at number one, but almost all of the movies he did in the 80s opened at like number five and then stayed at number five for two months. Yeah. But I mean, even Lost Boys became a cult hit on video. Yeah. But in theaters, it just did kind of, they all did money. They all did like more than mm -hmm. twice their budgets, but none of them were a major hit. Mm hmm that week, Ghost was already in its fifth week of running. Young Guns 2 mm. was still at number five. And other movies were Problem Child, Arachnophobia, and Die Hard 2, Die Harder. <laughs> Arachnophobia is great. And that was also the week that Twister opened, albeit not the Twister directed by Jan de Bont seven years later. <laughs> <laughs> and people forget there was a different Twister. Yeah, there was. It's not the same. <laughs> so in its second week of release, Flatliners dropped to number three, but that's just because Ghost suddenly shot back up to number one in its sixth week of release because it's Ghost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and opening that week at number two was The Exorcist 3 Legion. Hmm. Which is a fascinating movie. I still haven't seen Exorcist 1 yet. I haven't either, actually. We should see Exorcist 1 and Exorcist 3. Don't watch 2. Oh, I want to watch 2. Oh, no, you don't. You know who you're talking to. Yeah. <laughs> You don't want to watch two. <laughs> I'll watch one and three first. Okay, that's fair. That's good. And then also opening that week were My Blue Heaven and Taking Care of Business. Oh, and David Lynch's Wild at Heart. Hmm. An excellent film. Opened at number 10. It opened at 10? Small release, maybe? Probably not that many theaters. No, probably not. I mean, I, well, I guess I can see that. It's a fun movie, though. In its third week, Flatliners was still at number three. It held. Ghost dropped to number two because Dark Man opened at number one. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, those are the days. Did not think Dark Man had that bigger release. Okay. I did. I know it was a cult film, but I don't know how it would yeah. be overall. No, it actually had a pretty decent <laughs> ad campaign, if I remember right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People were still coming off of that late 80s Batman high. That's right, true. Right, right. Yeah. They were seeking an actual good comic book movie. Well, yeah, this was only one year. This was, Yeah, that's right. This was only one year mm -hmm. after Batman one year came after out. Batman. That's when you had Dick yep. Tracy yep. and Dark Man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ninja Turtles would have been a year later. Yeah. Yeah. And Dark Man looked cool and stylish. And let's be honest, it was Sam Raimi and it's great. So also opening that week were Men at Work, Pump Up the Volume, uh -huh. The Witches, and Delta Force 2 Operation Stronghold, which opened at 13. <laughs> Pump Up the Volume. Now that was a generation mover right there. Yeah. yeah. Opened at number nine. Mm -hmm. In its fourth week of release, Flatliners is still at number three. Ghost is back at number one <laughs> in its eighth week. Because it's Ghost. That movie had a lot of staying power, yeah. yeah. It had Patrick Swayze. Yes. Dark Man's at number two. I love that Young Guns, too, is still in the game at number nine. <laughs> And the only thing that opened that week was the Lemon Sisters, which I don't know what that is. I, yeah, yeah, I've never heard of that. Open at number 14. Oh, God. In its fifth week of release, Flatliners is still number four. <laughs> so yeah, it's already made $45 million, which is better than either of those two budgets. Ghost is still at number one. Dark Man is still at number two. <laughs> and I've never mentioned Presumed Innocent. That keeps floating around. Mm -hmm. And nothing else opened that week. In its sixth week of release, Flatliners is still at number four. <laughs> Dark Man has finally dropped out of the top five. Ghost is still number two. <laughs> and this is the week that Postcards from the Edge opened at number one. Oh, okay. Excellent. I don't remember that one. You don't remember Postcards from the Edge? I don't know Postcards from the Edge. I've heard the title, but I don't know about it. That title oh. is so, yeah, I know the title. Again, I was eight. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> How to describe that one. That's Shirley MacLaine and... Oh, oh, is that... Who's the actress who played Carrie Fisher? Was that the Carrie Fisher book? Yes. Okay, oh. Yes. I, I, that's okay. right. Okay. Yeah, I've never read the book and I've never watched the movie. I need to. It is quite a thing. Yeah, it's Meryl Streep and Shirley MacLaine. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. Carrie Fisher wrote the book and she also did the screenplay and it is quite a thing. And also opening that week at number three was Death Warrant and the mm. sci-fi film Hardware. In its seventh week of release, Flatliners finally drops to number seven. Ghost finally drops to number three. <laughs> this is the week that Narrow Margin and Funny About Love opened. And at number one is the release of Goodfellas. Mm. Oh. There's a fantastic movie. I still have never seen it. Oh, it's so good. It is so good. I never really got into Scorsese. <laughs> as far as Scorsese goes, it's one of the very best Scorsese's. 
In its eighth week of release, Flatliners is now at number eight. Might finally be wandering down. Once we get past ten, I'll call it quits. Opening at number one is Pacific Heights. I don't remember that one. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that's a, that was a thing. And opening at number six, I Come in Peace, the cult classic. <laughs> Craig R. Baxley. Yeah. In its ninth week of release, Flatliners just jumped back up to number seven. This is when Henry and June and Desperate Hours opened, and at number one is Marked for Death. <laughs> That's Steven Seagal, or who was Marked for Death? I was about to say, it sounds like Seagal or Van Damme or one of those. One of them. Yeah, it's one of those relatively anonymous action films. And number two is the re-release of Fantasia. Ooh. In its 10th week of release, we are still at week number 10. Flatliners has finally dropped to number 11. I think we'll call it quits here. But again, okay. 10 weeks in the top 10. Yeah, it's good. That's nice. Yeah, and in that 10th week is when Welcome Home, Roxy Carmichael opened at number 9, and Memphis Bell opened at number 2. Mm. So again, yeah, I think it had pretty good legs. The reviews at the time were kind of so-so. A lot of people were kind of like what we are. It's like, we like a lot mm. of what's in this movie. There's other areas where it could have been better. Yeah. Roger Ebert gave it a nice review. View, it had its fans. And again, it's built this huge cult following over the years. And by the way, I should say its total box office in the US was 60 million, mm-hmm. though the production manager says it was 150. I don't know which to believe. But again, that's <laughs> the most successful Joel Schumacher film today. This mm-hmm. again, this is his first wow. number one picture. And it's interesting hearing the lineup of the movies that it was going up against, you know, Ghost in there and Dark Man, mm-hmm. because this is kind of the beginning of the end of this whole era of like 80s early 90s sci-fi and horror genre stuff before the return of the slashers came up yeah Yeah. and all this stuff is just starting to die out in the early 90s and people were getting really sick of the super glossy hollywood product and then 1994 is when pulp fiction came in and jump-started the indie era so this Mm -hmm. was like the ebbing the very tail end of genre stuff Mm -hmm. being big at the box office and then 90s was all indie and quote unquote serious films. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then it all just surges back in the early 2000s. Sure. And again, that it's an effective. I would say it's an effective horror movie where it's a movie where nobody really dies outside of the deaths on the medical table. And it's Mm -hmm. not about the kills. It's not about the gore. It's not about anything. It's just about mood, atmosphere, and character-driven drama as people face their own past. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It shows how you can be very effective at that and be very successful at that without trying to go in the wrong... Like, if they had to be the ghosts, we're actually killing them off one by one. Mm Mm-hmm. And on that note, let me tell you a little bit about Final Destination. (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) Immediately after this film opened at number one, the studio was like, okay, so what are we going to do for the sequel? And Joel Schumacher was like, what now? (laughs) (laughs) So Joel didn't really continue. They kept throwing him scripts and begging him to do the sequel, but he wasn't really that interested because it's like he felt he had told the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they ultimately got Dennis Feldman who already had a script floating around Hollywood called Species <laughs> and had also previously written The Golden Child. An interesting little film. And would go on to write Virus. <laughs> oh, and he had also written and directed a film called Real Men, starring John Belushi and John Ritter, which is actually very fun. Mm. I like it. I remember that. Yeah. It's a fun movie. So is Golden Child. Golden Child is a fun movie and Species isn't a bad movie. Uh, I, uh, You and so, I can fight about Species later. <laughs> it's a beam. I think it's got a good first half, but it doesn't know where to go for the second. Haven't seen it since it came out. <laughs> they basically went through like every writer in Hollywood. What would you do with a sequel? And they ultimately went with him. And his idea was they push it even further and end up being able to see the future. And they see a future oh event in which a lot of people die. And they prevent Mm. the event, but because those people were destined to die, death starts hunting them one by one. Ah. AKA Final Destination. And so this script (laughs) kept circling around directors up until the end of the 90s when Final Destination came along and did the exact same story. And the producers were like, well, fuck, because we just spent all that money. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so yes there was almost a sequel to flatliners and that sequel was basically final destination and final destination didn't wow. really have any relationship to this script someone just mm. kind of independently came up with the same idea yeah and that happens all the time in yeah. hollywood oh sure all the time 
I don't know that I would have wanted a sequel that went down that direction. No. No. If Joel had been on board, I would be curious to see what he would do with it, but I think it says a lot that he didn't really care. Yeah, and I think that premise being used for a sequel kind of stomps on the things I like about yeah. this movie. Yeah. By adding this kind of supernatural element, death is stalking you, yeah. it's mm-hmm. taking away the nice grounded nature of what we have here. It's not personal anymore. Yeah. Right, right. Again, that's what I like about this movie is they're not really being haunted by ghosts. They themselves are the ghosts yeah. being mm-hmm. haunted by their own past. Mm-hmm. By making it this outside horror, these phantasms that are literally coming to kill them, and also to have the visions of the future. Because again, what I like is that in their quest to see beyond, they instead see inward. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, again, it just defies all that. Yeah, I mean, a sequel that builds maybe more towards those original themes would be interesting to explore, but that's not what they were interested in making. Yeah. Though it's probably got a stick in their craw that, oh, Final Destination beat us to the punch. Well, good luck for them. And then Final Destination is like on its eighth sequel by now. <laughs> <laughs> And they're just like, we could have had Flatliners 9. <laughs> so to be fair, this would have been timed right. I am surprised that we never got like a series of like five direct-to-video Flatliner sequels because I would have watched all of them. They would have been cheap to make. <laughs> I know. Yeah. How did we get two sequels to Sometimes They Come Back and The Mangler? <laughs> But we never got like a Flatliners 4, you know? Yeah. Probably because this wasn't a Dimension Miramax movie, but... (laughs) Right. Yeah, I think that probably has something to do with it. Mm Mm-hmm. And on a final note, we have another music video directed by Joel Schumacher tying into this film's soundtrack. It's a song called Party Town by Dave Stewart and the Spiritual Cowboys. And Dave Stewart, of course, was you know, part of the Arrhythmics, mm-hmm. which had just broken up by this time. Angie, did you have a chance to watch the music video? I did. I know, Melissa, you didn't. Yeah, sadly, I forgot about that part. To clarify, it is the song that's playing during the Halloween party. Yeah. Oh, without the oiled up sax guy. Right. Yes. Oh. Which is what this music video was missing. <laughs> Clearly. So, Angie, just first of all, what did you think of the song? I don't really like it. It's very <laughs> repetitive. It's very devil inside, yeah. Yeah, like it doesn't really go anywhere. I don't know. Like, I mean, I kind of get what he's trying to sing about, but it's, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Not something I care for. I liked it. I really like the song. I've listened to it like 20 times in the last week. All right. <laughs> I don't know. I like how catchy it is. I love that it's a band where they had two guitarists, two drummers, yeah. two bass guitarists, and they're all playing in sync. You know, like they're strumming the guitar to the beat of the drum, and it has this powerful percussive backing to it. It's just really driving and energetic. I didn't really care much for the actual song itself because yeah. I couldn't really make out his mumble of lyrics, but I like the pound of the energy of that. I like the chorus, and I like that the climax of the song does have that very intense build, mm. but that's just me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the two drummers is interesting, but I don't know. What did you think of the video? What I don't like doesn't have anything to do with Joel's direction. I'll say that. It's just very bland. I think Dave Stewart has no presence whatsoever. No. He's just kind of staring at the camera. He doesn't know how to lip sync, obviously. Yeah, so even when the song is intense, he's just kind of moodily staring. Right, through he's just staring. I do think that Joel did a really good job of picking scenes from the movie to match the tension of the song and the way the song was building. I thought that part was really well done. But the performance aspect of it was just really bland. The montage, and we saw this also with Lost in the Shadows Mm -hmm. and, again, Devil Inside. He's really great at cutting montage of just giving you this great, intense flurry of imagery. And Mm -hmm. it's all cut really well to the rhythm of the music. It's not just kind Mm -hmm. of haphazardly thrown together. But yeah, I mean, most of the rest of the video is just shots of the band. And Mm -hmm. again, it's like, you know, big swinging blue lights and yellow backgrounds, very harshly lit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I still think it's a fun video. I still think the way that it's lit and shot again gives further evidence that I believe he directed the Mummy Calls video. Mm -mm -mm -mm. (laughs) (laughs) You don't agree with. I don't agree. I don't. I will say who I think the real star of the video is and who I wish had been fronting the band for the song. The chick? Nan Vernon, the guitarist. Yeah, she's cool. She was awesome. But yeah, Dave Stewart is just so, it's like the way his hair is done in that pencil beard thing. It's like he's trying to be so cool. You know who he looks like? He looks like Dante Hicks. (laughs) (laughs) 
I was gonna say he looks like Judd Nelson, but like Judd Nelson by the time he was doing like his direct to video yeah. horror movies of the recent I think era. it's the facial hair that leads me in the Dante Hicks direction. Yeah. <laughs> I never understood that pencil beard where you're just having the yeah. edge of the beard along your jawline and you shave everything else. You probably can't grow a full beard, but you want to have something. That's my guess. I can't grow a full beard, but I'm not going to do that shit. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just guessing. I'm just embracing the neck beard. <laughs> I think that's just a... I'm trying to define my jawline, and I yeah. don't really want to commit to having a full beard. I guess so. Oh, you know who he looked like? The bad guy in Hackers. Oh, oh. yeah. He's just this kind of small, wormy, nerdy guy who's trying to be the coolest guy in the room. <laughs> I only recently saw that for the first time, like within the last you, month. Oh, wow. How was I not in the room with you for that? Cargill showed it to me. Oh, my God. That's my favorite movie of all time. <laughs> Oh my god, we have so much to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I don't think there's really anything else to add about the music video. No, there really isn't. No. Um, again, this isn't the end of the episode. There's going to be a special bonus extra length episode because we are going to be back because we are going to <laughs> finally watch and discuss the 2017 film version of Flatliners. You'll note I'm not calling it a remake. Okay. Mm. Mm. No, it's a remake. It's totally a remake. It's one of those half its cake and eat a two type things. Uh -huh. Kiefer's in it. That's all I'm saying. No, that's all right. Well, as long as it's more so than the Carrie, quote unquote, not a remake, then... <laughs> It's more like the Rage Carry 2. Okay. Let's remake it while also having it be a sequel. Right. But it's a remake. But it's not. But it is. Well, everybody, we're back. We just watched the 2017 Flatliners remake. It's Noel again here. Joined as always by Angie. Hello, everyone. And still with us is Melissa. Hello. So the 2017 version of Flatliners I don't really know much actual history to the movie. All I really have is just, you know, some info on the people who made it. Mm -hmm. The script was written by Ben Ripley. After debuting with the as-yet-unproduced thriller In Vitro, <laughs> which that just kind of writes itself, mm -hmm. Ripley rose up through the ranks writing not one, but two direct-to-video species sequels. <laughs> wow. Parts three and four. All right. By the way, in prep for this episode, I watched Species 3. It's a direct-to-video sequel. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate your dedication, but why? To be fair, <laughs> it actually had some interesting story. Ellen. It was a cheap, shoddily made <laughs> sequel, but it actually did have some interesting additions to the mythos and story construction. So I will give him that. <laughs> the species mythos. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you would be surprised how much he added <laughs> to the species mythos. Okay. There is one now. I Okay. <laughs> Technically. And after those, he then went on to finally break in selling a pair of original scripts, both of which have been made, the first of which was Source Code, the Duncan Jones movie. Which is great. And Boy Choir, which is a Dustin Hoffman children's choir movie. Okay. Which I had no idea existed. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it looks like a fairly good drama, got good reviews. Drama? Okay. Does it also involve time travel? No. Ah. Though I will say, I also, in prep for this, I have not watched it yet, but I did read his original script for Source Code, and it was a really good script. The director of the film is the Danish director Niels Arden Oplev, mm -hmm. who got his start in Denmark, did a number of you know, dramas, thrillers, all that stuff, and then in 2009 exploded onto the scene by directing the original version of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, the one starring Numi Rapace. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just out of curiosity, have either of you ever seen that one? Yes. Oh, yes. Is it good? I liked it. Very. It's very good. It's a hard watch. Mm. Sure. It's intense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, those of you who who know the plot of the girl with the dragon tattoo my friend ian and i walked out of that theater going that was really good but that was really it's hard rapey oh yeah <laughs> yeah i know yeah. what the story is and i know that it's very much exploring that content yeah mm -hmm. i just have never seen any of the film versions because that's one where i always wanted to check out the books and i just haven't gotten around to them yet mm -hmm. yeah i still haven't seen the david fincher version but the original mm -hmm. Film version is quite good. The David Fincher version is Americanized, but still very good. And then he came to Hollywood and did the 2013 film Dead Man Down, mm -hmm. starring Colin Farrell and Numira Pace, and then has become a pilot director, and he did the pilots for Under the Dome, Mr. Robot, and Midnight Texas. Okay. Ooh, I didn't know that. 
his most recent work is still Flatliners. To be fair, is recent, so... <laughs> yeah. That's otherwise all that I have. I don't really know much of the history about this film. I know certain details were released by the Sony email hacks, but I haven't really dug mm-hmm. into those emails, so I don't know and I don't really want to dig through all those emails. <laughs> I will say that I did read Ben Ripley's screenplay for the movie. Mm-hmm. Only like a third of that script is in this finished film, so it went through a hmm. lot of reworking. Huh. Okay. I'll save it till we get a little deeper in the episode. I'll tell you kind of what his draft was. Okay. Okay. And I don't know if he continued to do the rewrites, if other uncredited writers were brought in, but he's the only credited writer on a movie, which doesn't right. really mean much in Hollywood. But so. Yeah. So Angie, did you have a synopsis for this one? Yes, I do. Okay. It ended up being almost as long as the other <laughs> one, which kind of surprised me, but... uh. There are some differences here. It's the same Mm -hmm. framework, but a lot of different details. Right, right. We once again have a group of medical students who start to experiment with flatlining in order to see what's on the other side and what happens to our brains when we're there. The leader of the group is Courtney, who is driven by the fact that she killed her sister in a car accident. She hopes to see her again, and while she initially doesn't succeed, she does seem to open up her brain to parts of her memory that she wasn't able to access before. Jamie, a much more ethical slut than Joe, is next, and he sees himself riding a motorcycle through the town with an old flame. He and Courtney are so jazzed by their experiences that they think it's a fun idea to tear down an entire wall in her apartment and do other crazy things that I was thoroughly convinced had to still be Jamie's vision, but actually wasn't. She's not getting her security deposit back. No. (laughs) No. (laughs) Worst tenant. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. So, with the two of them achieving so much more in medical school, Marlo and Sophie insist on going next. Marlo has a terrifying vision of a man she accidentally killed in the ER, and Sophie relives her bullying of a classmate in high school. There is also once more a character who never goes under, Ray, who is much more David than Steckel. The movie then becomes more full-scale horror when they are all haunted by their mistakes. Turns out Courtney was texting while driving, which caused her sister's death, and Jamie ditched his girlfriend when she told him she was pregnant. Courtney is haunted by her sister, who chases her until she falls off her fire escape and dies. The group discusses the possibility of a demonic force that they may have attracted by flatlining. Sophie realizes the secret is to make amends and apologizes to the girl she bullied, and Jamie finds his ex with a young boy he realizes is his son. Marlo is then the one who goes under alone at the end, since she needs to apologize to a dead man. They fight to bring her back, and Courtney appears to her on the other side, saying she needs to own up to her mistakes in order to move forward. She is saved and tells the dean of the school what happened, who puts her on probation. The friends gather together to remember Courtney, having now made peace with their own issues and moving forward with their lives, destroying all evidence of their research. So Angie, do you recommend this movie? You know, I want to. There are things here that remind me very much of Silent Hill 2, the video game Mm. of people being haunted and plagued by their own mistakes in this sort of supernatural way. Unfortunately, it plays out more like Silent Hill 2, the movie, (laughs) which was full of pop scares and just really weird plotting and... The tone is just like, it takes such a hard right turn toward the end and goes full-scale horror that I was just kind of reeling for a moment. And it was like, wow, you're really, okay, that's what we're doing, all right. And this demonic force thing, I wanted to like it. I liked these characters better, but it just had too many problems for me to fully recommend it. Melissa, do you recommend it? I would recommend it for Flatliners completists, but uh, (laughs) such as there may be. I have the complete two. (laughs) (laughs) I felt it fell flat, and I think Edgy uh, hit on the reasons why pretty well. I think the um, tone is a little scattered, and it seems like the movie couldn't decide whether to go further into the drama of the characters dealing with their guilt or to go further with the horror movie elements. And it seemed like the horror movie elements didn't have as strong of an internal logic as they did in the first movie, 
which is part of what really worked about the first movie. And also, I feel like the first film, when it went into the hallucinogenic parts, it really went into Yandabant land and <laughs> had this amazing dreamlike quality and had a really great look to it and feel to those sequences. And this just kind of felt like, oh, it's time to turn up the bright lights a little bit and trot out some horror movie tropes. And, yeah. you know, let's, uh, why not? Just some flying glass and some random bits of violence and, you know, why not? It kind of felt like a mishmash, like when it tried to go into the hallucinogenic parts, it just didn't stay together and it kind of fell apart for me. I like the mix of characters better in this. I like mm -hmm. the fact that there wasn't a token woman this time. It's three women <laughs> and two guys. And yeah. even though each of the characters kind of have a counterpart in the original movie, and it's kind of the same driving force behind each of them. And there's, you know, one that doesn't go under and, you know, one accidentally killed somebody and one's the lady killer and, you know, one's et cetera, et cetera. You know, one mm -hmm. wronged a classmate. And so even though those characters all have counterparts in the original, I like the new things they tried to do with them. And yet I had to actually go look up all their names <laughs> <laughs> because it's like for some reason they felt like they were checking the boxes with the characters rather than really fleshing them out. Sometimes they worked, but a lot of times it didn't. Sometimes I wonder if the original Flatliners probably didn't have all that much on the page of the script either, but they had mm -hmm. such a strong set of actors working on it that they brought a lot to the screen just by themselves. Sure. And you don't have as much of that happening here, with the exception of like Diego Luna. I think Diego Luna, whenever he walks on screen, you know, he can just make anything happen with whatever <laughs> he's given. I don't like it as much as the original has that. To echo both of your thoughts, <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> to what you said, Melissa, yes, I don't think on paper this is any better or worse of a script that the original had, mm -hmm. but it's just the way in which the original was made just elevated it with such right. a theatrical quality that it was just so gripping to watch. Mm -hmm. This is fine. The direction in this is fine. The scenes of the scares are fine. The characters are fine. Everything is fine, but there's nothing there to like grab you. Yeah, yeah, there's nothing great. Yeah, it's one of those films where it's like, I'm like right in that middle where it's like, I don't recommend it because I don't think it's worth going out of your way to go see. Yeah. But I don't not recommend it because if you should watch it, I don't think it's going to like totally waste your time. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it's like a Sunday afternoon, what's on watch, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not like you're going to waste two hours with it. Yeah. But as long as you're not going in with the expectations of like tracking this down and like going out of your way for it. It's not bad, but it's just, it's not exciting. No, right. it's not. It's not exciting. It doesn't dig any deeper into the philosophies or themes than the original did. Mm -mm. And for all of its horror sequences, they're not badly constructed, but they're not as just like in your face, holy crap, what did I just see? As the original film was. Yeah. We didn't even get one neon light. We needed just one neon, <laughs> one black light. Well, we got a hailstorm. Yeah. That was in real life. I'm wondering if the hailstorm just happened in Toronto and they're like, oh, we got to go <laughs> film in the hailstorm. <laughs> just kind of moving now into open discussion. That was one element that I thought mm -hmm. was an interesting addition, even though I think they underexplored it, was the whole almost euphoric high that people get after the flatlining, yeah. where it's like yeah. they're in like sensory overdrive drive all of their memories have flashed back to the surface so they can recall things that they forgot. Mm -hmm. It's like they're on ecstasy, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I kind of like that moment where they just give in and just party down, even though it's like, only this person and that person have done it. Why isn't everyone else just kind of being like, what's going on with those two? Yeah. <laughs> right, right. Like, the scene yeah. at the party later makes more sense. Yeah. Because at least by that point, nearly all of them have gone through it. And why is nobody acting like their ribs are bruised and <laughs> that, you know, they just went through <laughs> convulsive shocks of electricity <laughs> that would you know you would have to recover from and you're able to speak even though you had been intubated okay they've been intubated and then they're drinking vodka right after it <laughs> <Ouch>. wow <laughs> lots and lots of vodka. wow 
<laughs> oh my god no mm-hmm. yes yeah so it is interesting that there's elements with this movie that kind of parallel like drug movies like you know those 80s cocaine movies where it's mm-hmm. the freewheeling reckless abandon of the high those scenes where it's kind of like you're showing the appeal of the drugs before you get to the crash <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah it reminds me a lot of those type movies but it's still my biggest problem with this entire movie and i hate to say it feels like cw's flatliners <laughs> <laughs> because CW has come so far over the years. You know, this is like early yeah. 2000 CW. Everything is just a little too pretty and clean. Everything is a little too crisp and smooth and mm. nothing ever has any bite to it. Which is a hilarious thing to say after us comparing this to the original Flatliners because, right. <laughs> oh my God, Jan Devant. That's like the definition of slick and smooth. No, but again, the original is so over the top and it's so cinematic and operatic. And again, well, because yeah. they brought in that yeah. Italian opera designer, it's just the handheld wide lens cameras swooshing around all the glowing <laughs> sets. And it's so grandiose mm-hmm. as literally mm-hmm. their entire world explodes into this dream. And here everything is just very... It's very TV movie. It feels mm-hmm. very TV. Yeah. Yeah. I accidentally had the smoothing on my TV on oh for my the God. first few scenes. So I was really like, man, this looks like it was made for TV. What the heck? And then finally I went and checked the settings and I was like, oh, okay. So that at least explains part of it. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. The one thing wow. that I do like is that one problem that I had with the original was after they had had the flatlining, no one really just sat down and talked about what they had just been through, like on a scientific level. Mm-hmm. Here you actually see scenes where they sit down, they describe what they went through. I love the scene where they sit down on the couch and here, let's watch your brain scan second by second yeah. as you went through this experience. Mm-hmm. Probably completely inaccurate, but I at least like that they included that where it's they can see that something is actually happening and then that drives them to pursue this further. Yeah. Yeah, it was neat. But it's interesting that that's instantly dropped once they start hallucinating stuff. Yes. That's true. Because they're all in the sciences, you know, they'd be going, what the hell is going on? And even with the first few hallucinogenic sequences, it makes it really clear they're hallucinations. It's not happening in the real world Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. you see things like replace themselves immediately, you know, like the shower curtains torn down and then all Mm -hmm. of a sudden it's back up again. So you'd think, even though they're having these really freaky experiences, and that does cause people to not think quite as logically, Mm -hmm. but still, you'd think they'd be going, at the very least, okay, this is very clearly a euphoric experience after we're done with this. I must have overloaded my brain Mm -hmm. with neurotransmitters, Mm -hmm. and this is what I'm going through. Let's go back through the data and find out what it is. Yes. But that's not as cinematic. (laughs) No, it's not. (laughs) Well, I'll get into that when we get to the original script. But yeah, I kind of like that when we see Courtney's first one, that it is that classic out of body, like soaring up through the roof and out into the city and soaring all around. And mm-hmm. now you're only just starting to get those glimpses of into the past. Or like even when Marlo has hers, she goes through the whole life flashing before her eyes is seeing, you know, all of these things oh, yeah. where she strives to be the best music, swimming and all that stuff. You know, those mm-hmm. things are great because they track with the classic near death experience. Mm-hmm. And then I kind of like that then these hallucinations start bleeding in in just little subtle ways where i mean you know like with the curtain in the bathroom you know you could be tired you could just think like oh crap i need to get more sleep or something like that it's like those quick little things where it's like you could accept that your brain is maybe playing tricks on you Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then when it starts to press on and drag out further and further and further then it's not like in the last film where he was just hiding everything yeah yeah in this one it's like they're only discovering this along the way and they're Mm -hmm. also just caught the euphoria that it's not until after more people have and pulled into it that then you start to learn the consequences of the come down yeah right so about it being a demonic force <laughs> <laughs> now melissa help me unpack the scientific research behind <laughs> <laughs> the, the science between demonic forces yeah well noel <laughs> I'll be honest, there's aspects of this movie, and that especially feels like one where it feels like studio notes. Yeah. yeah. yeah it, it really, really does. does. That's about when the film started going, oh, God, they just want to turn this into another Final Destination movie, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. 
Because once we actually lost one of the characters, you know, once she actually dies, then you go, oh no, oh no. They want another Final Destination. They want young, pretty people to die a lot and then have a couple of them survive at the end. Yeah. Which I don't think having her death is necessarily a bad thing. No. In and of itself. Like, I think you could have that and, you know, okay, yeah, they're dealing with some pretty harsh consequences. This feels really real to them. But yeah, unfortunately, they just use it to then go, okay, yeah, now we're going full scale horror movie here. Mm -hmm. And that I think was interesting because the last film, everyone still lived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Though I forgot to bring it up in the last episode. I forgot the Kiefer Sutherland character in the script actually did die at the very end where they bring him back. He says his little message at the end and then goes through an aortic rupture because because of everything that they had just pumped into his system and the fact that he had gone through flatlining twice in a week. <laughs> and there's like nothing that they could do to bring him back from that. Oh, okay. You know, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but clearly he survived because he's in this movie. Yes. <laughs> right. Before we get to that, though. When did Kiefer Sutherland get old? Well, but he's president now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes you old. Well, he was all those years tracking down terrorists and beating the truth out of them <laughs> at 24. Mm. <laughs> That can age you 24 years a season, you know, it's... <laughs> That's why he became the designated survivor. <laughs> but, I mean, like, the demonic forces thing, the thing that makes it feel the worst is that it comes out of nowhere and never mm -hmm. comes up ever again. Yeah. You could right. cut that entire scene out. Yep. Yeah, I mean, they could have gone into more techno babble at that dinner table, and I don't think it would have taken anything away from no. the horror of the situation, because they're going mm -hmm. through very real consequences of what the hell they did. Right. But, I mean, it feels very much like they're probably making something that's closer to the original, and then one of the producers was like, hey, have you seen those Conjuring movies? Have you seen that Insidious? <laughs> mm -hmm. Can we make it a bit more like the Conjuring and the Insidious? Well, the, the thing that really just gets me about that is once they mention demonic forces, it feels cheap because yeah. you have such an opportunity with how do you fight this? This is the call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> your brain is fighting itself. You're fighting your own memories. yeah. And they're all yeah. fighting their own brains. And how do you fight this? How do you make sense of it? And how do you overcome it? I mean, really, when you watch The Babadook, that's what works so well about mm -hmm. The Babadook is like, even though it's presented as an outside force in the movie, it's very clearly internal. Mm -hmm. It's this woman's grief and mental illnesses personified. There's so much more of a script opportunity yeah. if you don't veer in the direction of it's an outside force. Right. And that's, again, where, you know, the original film was so grandiosely supernatural without actually being supernatural because it literally was just them fighting themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And to take it away from them fighting themselves and have it be this outside thing, which honestly, I don't even think it is. I think that demonic thing is just something they threw out in a way that maybe they're just speculating and spitballing ideas. I think the film as presented is still them fighting themselves, but just by throwing that in there, it does cheapen everything. Yeah. yeah, it really does. And again, how they did basically assign a ghost to each person. <laughs> <laughs> a specific ghost that each person is haunted by as opposed to just the actual event itself to be something creepy that will lurch after them and have disembodied hands reaching in from out of camera. Not everybody was actually dead, so it didn't yeah. even make sense for them to be a ghost. No, it didn't. Well, it's the image of them. I'd say ghost with air quotes. No, I know. I know. Yeah. They are given a specific personification. Yeah, whatever the personification right. of the guilt is. And plus, I figured this is like the pinnacle of, man, you were given this to work with and you did very little to nothing with it. Mm -hmm. You have one character that's essentially, he's being haunted by the fact that he abandoned this woman mm -hmm. who he got pregnant. You've got one scene where he's starting to be haunted by a baby crying that he can't figure out with. That's amazing. That's an amazing thing to work with. Creepy baby crying. And they do so little with it. Though I did love the genuine, delicate effect of seeing the writhing form under a blanket, and as he picks up the blanket, there's nothing underneath it. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a lovely yeah. thing. That was a really nice effect. That is a lovely effect. If there was more of that going on in the hallucination sequences, maybe it would have worked better. Mm -hmm. But so many of them were just very stock imagery, it seemed to me. Yeah. Yeah, and it was like, just take a figure from their history, make them creepy, and literally just 
to go back to the original film, you remember how the Kiefer character was being stalked by this child who would always mm-hmm. attack him. I can see where they kind of latched on to that. Mm-hmm. But what was nice about the original film was everybody had such a unique experience under themselves. Yeah, different stuff. Mm-hmm. And this film, everyone just has this creepy figure that's always like standing behind them or like, again, just like poking from out of camera, you know, or just doing all this weird, creepy stuff. One pushes someone off of a roof, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. Well, think of Kiefer's haunting in the original film. The kid, whenever he appears, does not look like the girl from The Ring. He's not (laughs) hollow-eyed. He doesn't have damp hair. He's energetic and malevolent. He is Mm -hmm. malevolent. He laughs. He has a hoodie on. And he's a physically small child who we see beating the shit out of an older man. (laughs) Yeah. Which is just in itself a terrifying image. Yeah. But he's not presented necessarily as a ghost, just as sort of this force that appears once in a while. He's almost like a demonic. Fort, no. <laughs> no. Shh, 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 shh. With a hockey stick. Now we're in dogma territory. What's going on? Oh, oh. He came from the pits of H E double hockey sticks. Oh, God. <laughs> Oh, God. But that's very different from the guy who abandoned the woman who was going to have an abortion. Mm-hmm. She's showing up looking like, like a ghost. the ring monster yeah. Yeah. when the woman is alive and well. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, but again, it's not her actual ghost. It's the image yeah. of her. No, it's the image of her. But the thing is, that's so unnecessary. You know what I did like about... Okay, so we'll get specifically into the Jamie story here. I did like Mm -hmm. the initial way in which she started appearing where it's like, again, she's riding behind him on the motorcycle as his hallucination is just racing through the city streets all alone at night, you know, with this one Mm -hmm. girl on the back of his motorcycle. And then she's gone. And then you have the bit where he sees her outside the window standing there, kind of like the monster from It Follows, just kind of standing there as traffic is passing around her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because she's just staring at him. Yeah. Right. And then you have the bit where when he first sees her on the boat, she's crying under the covers in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, it's like you're putting together that there was this emotional experience that happened with this woman. Right. And then, yeah, all the stuff with the baby is great. But then to just kind of devolve it into the whole scene where she's chasing him on the boat as literally just like popping up and just kind of standing there and this director really likes to do the a hand suddenly reaches in from out of frame you know Mm -hmm. yeah which to be fair i do think the actual editing and composition of those scenes it's mildly effective but it's not that interesting yeah and again it's like i like his story because it was all about running away from the responsibility not only the responsibility of fatherhood but the responsibility of cleaning up his own messes Where he was Mm -hmm. going to take her Mm -hmm. to get the abortion and then bailed on that. He bailed on being a father and he bailed on even not being a father. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is an interesting story for him to have to confront. And then that's interesting how that's kind of an interesting play on, again, the William Baldwin character. But again, the Baldwin character had that such great iconic scene. Yeah. It's not even a horrific scene, but it's just a room full of women throwing every pickup line he ever delivered at them. Yeah. Yeah. Even, you know, the Kevin Bacon character, his hallucination is not this terrifying, monstrous image that's stalking him. (laughs) It's this little girl spouting every insult that he's ever said to her. Right. Yeah. That's what's interesting. And another thing that I very much miss, aside from Oliver Platt, (laughs) the first film spends so much time on the release, the relief that happens after one of the characters apologizes or asks for forgiveness Mm -hmm. or Mm -hmm. gets something right. There is so much drama brought out in that movie when the father's story is understood, when the Mm -hmm. apology is given to the woman in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. There is so much made of those scenes, and the catharsis is wonderful. Mm -hmm. It just absolutely lays flat in this movie. Yeah. The whole thing with Sophie, when she finds the girl... She's saying, yeah, I did some awful things, but I'm not sure she even says, I'm sorry. She focuses on, I need you to forgive me. Yes. Yeah. That's the big difference. Which is a really bad way to phrase that. I don't think she said, I'm sorry. She said, I'd like you to accept my apology. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. I I wrote that down word for word because I was so fucking angry at that. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to scrub the words forgive me from the English language because yes. that puts the onus on the victim to right. do something for you. And that's what was so strong about the Kevin Bacon scene was yes! where he mm-hmm. made it clear that he knew what he did. He knew how it hurt her. And he said, yeah. I'm sorry. 
I'll go. And as he's walking out, she chooses to forgive him. Right. I mean, the thing is, you can literally have regret and literally feel genuinely horrible about something that you did. Mm -hmm. And the other person can refuse to accept your apology. Yeah. Right. People can refuse to forgive you. They're allowed to do that. And that is never a requirement of an apology. Yeah, it, it right. should never be. That Sophie scene is terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that whole scene just made me feel gross. It's like, oh, you took something that was done so right in mm-hmm. the original mm-hmm. movie and did everything wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Oh. And that, yeah, that it was this interestingly bizarre story about cyberbullying and having released this girl's nude photos. Mm-hmm. It's a story that doesn't have anything to do with Sophie's other story, which is Sophie's big plot is dealing with her mother. Yeah. Well, the idea is that she was so pressured by her mother to succeed that she felt the need to sabotage this um... girl. But I also don't think the timeline really works out because if she's 25 years old... I don't know that you could have hacked someone's phone to find nude pictures when you were in high school. (laughs) Just saying. Wow. (laughs) Well, she didn't hack the computer. The woman literally just left the computer there. She said she hacked her phone when she's apologizing to her. That's what she said, which did look more like a computer. No, but we see the flashback where she's actually there. And you as the woman went up to talk to the teacher, it's like, I can't remember if it was her phone or her computer, but it was like literally right there and she went over and grabbed it. Then they really messed up the line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Something. Well, Reshoots. Yeah. I'm thinking, I got my first iPhone in 2009, which was nine years ago. And mm. this movie was last year. So eh, maybe. Okay. Eh. Mm -hmm. All right. Maybe. One thing I should also point out. So not only did this finished film differ from that screenplay that I read significantly, Mm -hmm. but this film continued to go through reshoots. This film was supposed to come out in August of 2017. They pushed it back one month to September so they could do additional reshoots in August. Wow. So like three weeks before the film was supposed to come out, they were still shooting new scenes for the film. Yikes. Jeez. And I think you can feel it in certain things that just feel grafted on and don't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like her dialogue not matching what was actually happening in the movie. Yeah. You know, the demonic possession thing that comes out of nowhere and goes nowhere. Mm Mm-hmm. I like the whole Sophie dealing with her mom, but again, it feels underdeveloped. Right. I actually genuinely like the scene where her and Jamie are having sex while the mom's outside the door just being pissed as hell about it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then like he just walks out like huge sex grin on his face. Hi, nice to meet you. (laughs) (laughs) And then Sophie walks out and says, I'm moving out. Right. That's a very interesting like way to finally break yourself from a controlling parental figure. That's a Mm -hmm. nice moment. Mm -hmm. But again, the thing that she's struggling with in the movie is so divided from that. It doesn't feel like she's getting a victory from anything that's really that tied intrinsic to the plot. No, her visions should have somehow had something to do more closely with her mother, I think would have worked a lot better. They did in the script. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. If it had been brought closer to home, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. It would have been a stronger choice. When we talk about Courtney, the Ellen Page character. It's like she's sort of the Julia Roberts character. Well, it was funny, like in the original episode, we were like, what if the Julia Roberts character had instigated the experiment? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that did work. I guess like they were trying to find a reason to make her feel even worse. Like, I feel like the whole thing with the phone really wasn't necessary. It could have just been that she accidentally killed her sister by getting in the wreck and that would have been upsetting enough. But I don't know. I do like Ellen Page in general. I didn't feel like she necessarily brought a whole lot to this one, though. (sighs) Yeah, kind of the same. So many sighs in this movie. I'm going to leave them Mm. all in. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, there, there's... Hmm, hmm. I agree. I like the fact that she was the instigator of the whole experiment thing. But I don't know, there's just not enough life in that character. There's mm-hmm. something, aside from the things she's been through, there was no other personality to that character whatsoever. At least Marlo yeah. had the perfectionism and the drive, and she has that focus, so she was distinct from the other four characters mm-hmm. in that way. But there was something mm-hmm. so bland about the Ellen Page character that it just... Eh. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that didn't quite work for me was... Okay, so whenever someone flatlines, what they ultimately have to deal with is something that they've kind of almost buried and repressed. 
or something that mm-hmm. they've refused to deal with. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But the whole thing of her sister dying in the car is what led her to start this experiment in the first place. So she's already confronted and used it as a driving motivating factor to set up mm-hmm. this entire scenario. Ooh, yeah. I, I yeah. see what you're driving at. Yeah. So why is that the thing that she still has to deal with when instigating this entire plot is how she's been dealing with it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's just a very weak narrative point in the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's not that, you know, the backstory is bad. And I like the seeing the face up against the shower curtain was a nice effect. I like the bit where she sees her sister just sitting there drawing, you know, with little crayon pictures that she's then setting on candles that burn away. That's a nice image. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But then the whole chase up the fire escape and the pushing her off and all, it, it just feels kind of cheap. Mm-hmm. It really does. And Ellen Page is a good actor, but yeah, there's not enough meat there to dig in. And what was also interesting was in the original, this group already knew what they were all getting into. Mm-hmm. Whereas in mm-hmm. this one, Ellen Page is the only one who knows of this experiment. And she literally tricks two other people into coming there and yeah. throws it all at them and they just suddenly go along or at least Jamie <laughs> suddenly goes along with it and stops her heart. Right, right. And then I kind of like that then Ray is pulled into it because it's an emergency and he's the best person for an emergency and Marlo just wanders in. Yeah. It's a little too convenient that everything just fell into place for this group to be a part of everything. Again, very final destination of here's your group of people and here's how they all (laughs) fell into place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the original, it was that great thing of they're all going through this moral struggle of, wait, are we really going to do this? Are we really Mm going to do this? And that was compelling because it also had this mystery to it of they're all just vaguely talking about this thing that they're going to get together to do that night. And, you know, everyone's kind of uncertain. No one really knows who's going to be there. You know, the whole today's a good day to die type thing. You know, it does a great job of lulling you into the setup. Mm -hmm. This one, they just throw it at you. Yeah. Hit the ground running. Yeah. And when you think about it, the first one had this almost kind of suicide pact sort of thing going on with all the Mm -hmm. characters. They all contributed to it. They're all in on it. They're friends. You know their ties together. Whereas in the newer movie, characters feel thrown together. The issue with having the Ellen Page character throw everything together and then draw people in to help her is you see that little lab set up and you go, you got this all together yourself? (laughs) She just found it down there. (laughs) I love it's a fully stocked and operational sub-basement that they keep in case of emergencies. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's where they would keep all of the outdated equipment. Right. You know, it's like, we don't want to throw away the old equipment. We can save that in case of an emergency, but... Yeah, how great would it have been if they were using all this old 1970s equipment <laughs> and just mm. cobbled together? Yeah. Oh, and by the way, there can be no metal in this room. Have you, did you see how much metal was in that room? <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? There are cell phones. <laughs> there are laptops. There are entire machines made of metal. What's that gurney made out of? No, and that's what's funny is they even make a point that she's wearing a sports bra so she won't have to deal with the metal wire but then we see other characters wearing bra bras Uh yeah just throw in the throwaway line and everyone will forgive you right (laughs) and you have to hope that of these five people nobody has a filling (laughs) (laughs) yeah she was checking all of their teeth ahead of time Mm -hmm. she knew (laughs) oh my god or an implant or a screw in their knee or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Of these five people who randomly come together without any preparation. Yeah. <laughs> right. See, it's stuff like this is what bugs me about this movie is where it's like, mm-hmm. I don't even know how much of this is that someone didn't sit down and think it through because we'll get to the script again. That's very different. And how much of it is just the typical Hollywood, too many cooks in the kitchens, too many producers throwing in their own thing and the thing just kind of becomes a jumbled together rushed hodgepodge. Yeah. Oh, and can we address throwing the laptop in the river? <laughs> Where all of that research has been for naught. No, 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 no. Well, just that's going to kill it Just like throwing a laptop in a river. Just take the drive out, donate it to (laughs) charity or something, rather than just polluting the world. Also, if you're trying to destroy that data, throwing it in a river is not Not a great way to do it. You can recover that data. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Then maybe that was a setup for a potential sequel. Wipe the machine! Oh my god, no. Oh, what the fuck would you do with a sequel? Someone's going to fish it out of the river, and then they're going to redo the experiments, and you've got Flatliners too. It's no. like Jumanji, that laptop just keeps getting passed around to new experiments. No. <laughs> okay, okay, so if Kiefer Sutherland comes back in Flatliners 2, the sequel, <laughs> fishes it out of the river. <sighs> 
And they do this experiment in a van down by the river. <laughs> down by the river. <laughs> oh, God. Imagine, like, David Spade flatlining and experiencing Chris uh, Farley. <laughs> and then Claire de Lune plays. <laughs> I did like the touch of Claire de Lune. I actually really like that moment near the end where they're all sitting in the restaurant and the guy starts playing Claire de Lune. And it's like, it's an innocent moment that still has this impact on them because of the sudden memory of their friend. Yeah. I'm fine with a mm. moment like that. That was fun. Also, Claire de Lune is a very fine piece oh, yes. of music. Thank you, Debussy. Thank you, Godzilla. <laughs> That new trailer is wonderful. Yes, that is a fantastic trailer. <laughs> so let's move on to the character of Marlo. I like the Marlo character a lot. I feel that character, she doesn't have a whole lot of screen time, but she's very sharply defined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I like what they do with that character. I like that her personality is very tied into what her haunting is, for lack of a better term. This one mistake that she had to bury so she wouldn't fail. Yeah. Yeah. And I do like the interaction between her and Mr. Rogue One. Yeah, what's Ray. his nose? Uh, 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 Diego <laughs> Luna. <laughs> Mr. E2 Mama Tambien. Yes. Yes. Very well done. <laughs> I like that interaction action where he says if you can't face up to that you shouldn't be a doctor it's like oh very good very good mr yeah. ethics i like you i like her a lot i like that character a lot yeah she's probably the most well i guess i shouldn't say necessarily most well written maybe the most intact from the script and that's why she feels more alive i don't know yeah but she's the one who has probably the best arc yeah, yeah. she does or most, the most successful arc most thought out and most well played and yeah yeah she's a nice complex character yeah, no, I like that they took the, I hate to say it, but the stereotype of the perfectionist ice queen. Mm -hmm. And again, just really cut into there's so many driving factors. She's pushed so hard to accomplish so much in her life. And literally this one mistake she made could have torn it all down. And the anxiety over that. Well, and I like they don't necessarily go after all the ice queen tropes. No, no. No. She's portrayed as desirable. She is focused and she's not scoffed at. Yeah, no, she's not uncompassionate. I think it's just yeah. that she isn't as close to these other people because she's focused. She, I, I think yeah. that's the thing. Mm -hmm. She's focused. And not in a way that's negative. It's just she doesn't connect as well with other people. Mm -hmm. Right. And then the Diego Luna character is, again, basically, again, the Kevin Bacon character from the last one where he's the kind of damn it, Jim, Dr. Bones, just get in there mm -hmm. and do your job and save the <laughs> lives. And Yeah. He's their conscience in a lot yes. of ways. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. How dare you flatline, James? <laughs> <laughs> I like his character. I like their relationship where, again, he is the pure doctor. Yeah. yeah. I want to say she is the perfect doctor and he is the pure doctor. You know, the obtained talent versus natural talent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I think they make an interesting contrast and also you know, come together in a very interesting way. Yeah. Because they both love this profession, even though they come at it from two completely different ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's like the holistic doctor, not yeah. necessarily in terms of like alternative medicine, but he's very much about the patient experience and things like that. Whereas she's, here's the chemical explanation for all these yes. symptoms mm -hmm. that you have. What I like is they don't really dig into it much, but his backstory as a firefighter, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he knows the tragedy that leads people to the hospital. Right. Yeah. You know, on a very human level. And so it is interesting bringing them together, but I don't know, they're so just so bland. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> And, you know, in her whole horror scenes, again, like the scene in the morgue mm -hmm. where it's suddenly like surrounded by all these open caskets and zombies and yeah. all the lights are flickering. And it's not that it's a badly executed scene. It's just it's so typical. Yep. Yeah. With all the horror scenes, I think the biggest problem, again, is it's not that it's badly executed. It's just so by the numbers. Yeah. You've seen this in plenty of other yes. horror movies before. Yep. Yeah. I think people genuinely have forgotten how to do dream sequences and forgotten how to actually portray what dreams are actually like. They just kind of copy other dream sequences from other movies, which is what I think is happening here. It's like, when you think about it, if I had a mistake like that and I would be dreaming about it, when your dreams are almost never specifically about that thing, it's always manifesting as something else. So wouldn't her haunting be about repeatedly failing and failing and failing or something like that mm -hmm. rather than being attacked by a dead guy? Yeah, like we saw all those yeah. flashes of her life and all of her accomplishments. What if it's like I fell behind in the race, my violin string broke, you know? Mm -hmm. It's literally like all of her accomplishments being undone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because of this mistake, everything could be wiped out. 
And again, just mm-hmm. seeing, I accomplished this and it's undone. I accomplished this and it's undone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because they go for approaching it on a very visual level in terms of ghosts and boo scares, mm-hmm. they aren't really digging into the psychology. And again, like even the ghost and boo scares of the original, it was this masochistic pain that he was inflicting on himself. Right. You need to dig into the actual characters and what is this emotional experience that they're... That's the biggest problem I have with this movie is it's not emotional. Right. No, right. I mean, it makes all the moves. And the original is pure emotion. Yeah. It's focusing on the characters like it wants to make it more about the characters, and yet it Mm -hmm. doesn't actually succeed about that. Yeah. It's like there's flashes of potential, but instead it just goes off to the spooky stuff instead. Yeah. And Mm -hmm. like her big whole final vision is just being dragged across the floor with this smoke coming at you from the other end of a very long corridor. Yeah. And suddenly a shimmery Ellen Page appears and says, you really need to forgive yourself. Yeah. Just even thinking about that on paper, it's like, really? Everything's been building up to this moment? Why does he drown her? I don't... Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Whereas, you know, in the original, it was, again, building up to him having to fall out of the tree that he knocked the other boy out of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, her having to embrace her father. William Baldwin having to see his fiance watch his tapes. You know, Mm -hmm. everything had a build. You know, Kevin Bacon getting forgiveness. Everything built up to a moment, and that moment was a perfect resolution to everything that it had been building towards. You don't get that here. Nope. No. You also don't have Oliver Platt, and I feel very sad about it. (laughs) Do you imagine if he was the head surgeon that they brought back? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I would be so on board. I really would. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about the Kiefer Sutherland character. So Kiefer Sutherland is the teacher, the dean, whatever, right. who's instructing these students. He walks with a limp. He pops up, gives little bits of advice, checks in on things, but otherwise doesn't really tie into the plot. Mm-hmm. But what would you think of him? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, like, there really isn't a whole lot to say because he doesn't really get to do much other than quiz them on medical knowledge and then say, hey, this was your friend, right? So go do something about it. He's not even really a mentor figure. He's just kind of no. there. He's checking a box because it's a remake, I feel like, more than anything else. Yeah, I feel like it's the drive-by. Hi, I'm a cameo. And then it goes on like one scene too long. But I feel like it's about the right amount for the hi, I'm a cameo thing. Mostly I just look at him and go, God, when did he get old? (laughs) (laughs) Well, they're kind of playing it up with the cane and everything. But Mm. okay, so here's the thing. None of this came from the original script. This was all something that happened over filming. There was a scene in the movie at the end of the movie where he confronts the kids and reveals that he is Nelson from the original film. And that he saw what they were doing. But because he knew that this is a journey that once you go down, you have to complete, he let them do it. Hmm. And he hopes that they found whatever answers they needed to find. And the director said that that scene played really, really well to people who had seen the original movie, but new audiences were just kind of like, what the hell, this came out of nowhere. They didn't get the reveal. Ah, Okay. That's too bad. And again, like Flatliners was a huge film in the 90s, but it has kind of become distant over time. Mm -hmm. And apparently the deleted scene is on the Blu-ray, but I don't have the Blu-ray. Oh, yeah. So that reveal was put in, but then it was cut. It's all wishy-washy where his character does have a different name, but the director was like, yes, and he changed his name. (laughs) So it's one of those kind of have your cake and eat it too. It's like, it's a sequel, it's a remake, but it's not really a sequel, but it's a remake. Yeah. They didn't commit to it. Yeah. If you're going to make this a sequel, they don't do enough to escalate this or or to evolve the situation to another degree beyond the original. So that if you watch this and the original back to back, Mm -hmm. it's just the same movie. That's like the biggest problem I had with the Thing prequel is that it adds nothing new to the experience. You're literally, if you watch the prequel and then you watch the Thing, you're literally just watching the same movie. Right. Mm -hmm. I hate it when they do that. It's like, if you're going to do it, then do something interesting with it. But if you're just going to have it be its own movie as a remake, that's fine. This is fine. Okay. It's not as good, but I can live with it. I mean, at least we didn't get the sequel that was Final Destination. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's true. 
I mean, if you're going to make a sequel, why just make the same damn movie? Take the ball and run with it. Yeah. And that's what I've always been about. Like, what does this movie contribute? Why did somebody look at Flantliners and say, I could make this better? Nobody ever comes to a remake saying, I can make this better. It's about representing a story to a new generation. I don't have a problem with that. I mean, that's mm. fair, but... I just don't think they did a very good job. <laughs> I agree with you there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> When you're going to move something into a whole new decade and remake it, like even if you make the same damn movie, you have to ask yourself, how do we not just translate it to a new audience, but also what opportunities do I have? What can I do now that I wouldn't have been able to do 30 years ago with this plot right. line? What could add a new angle to the story? What right. could open up new avenues for right. interesting things to happen? Yeah. Well, and there's ways to do that in quiet ways, too. Whereas what I always love about the remake of Night of the Living Dead was where Savini was always like, we're telling the same story, but I wanted people who were familiar with the original to feel like the same things were going to happen and then catch them by surprise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then also play this film to new audiences so that if they watch the original, they think they know what's going to happen then suddenly it'll catch them by surprise <laughs> yeah i love that remake yeah. i love that movie when you're smart about a remake i think that's the problem was this is not a smart remake no no it's a generic remake yeah so anything else you all want to add before i kind of get into the script here just a little bit i'm wondering how you get a cell phone signal in a morgue how do you get a cell phone signal in a sub-basement emergency bunker and in a morgue <laughs> well you're not supposed to have metal don't forget that too <laughs> <laughs> that's true where they're they're texting someone while the mri machine yeah. see that's why when the mri mm -hmm. machines are going on all of the equipment is in another room right. separated mm -hmm. by walls that have shielding yep yeah i love how all the <laughs> computers are perfectly operational in the same room with that mr that yeah. is the best lit mri machine i've ever seen <laughs> why do they have that in the basement also when jamie when the mri machine is going on and jamie is doing chest compressions he's wearing a watch yeah <laughs> Like, my, my, it's plastic. The defibrillator. The defibrillator. <laughs> is metal, yes. The, is metal. <laughs> However, I will say, what I will give them a tiny little bonus point for is they actually did incorporate... Don't defibrillate her now. Her heart has stopped. That won't do anything. Yeah, bravo mm -hmm. that. And they did incorporate that you do have to actually do compressions and inject stimulants in order to start to get a pulse in order to use the defibrillator to reset to a full pulse. Right. Yes. That is how it's supposed to work. Again, it only works in like 3% of cases and most people die. But at least I give them the minor point of that. But I love <laughs> that she says the line after he's already ineffectively defibrillated someone. Yeah. <laughs> right. And better CPR posture in this movie. Mm -hmm. I will give it points for that because <laughs> I bitched about that earlier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Still not perfect, but much better. Mm -hmm. Much better than I see in most movies. So I'll give them points for that. There was a lot of intubation, like unnecessary mm -hmm. intubation. That was interesting, the intubation. Yeah, that doesn't really... Yeah. Yeah. You're not really trying to inflate the lungs. You're trying to get the pulse started. That's not really defined yeah. by breathing. And it's not like they're choking or they're not trying to clear blockage or anything like that. They're it's, not trying to get fluid right. out of the lungs. The mouth-to-mouth -mouth yeah. is not necessary when you're trying to restart a heart. Right. But also, you know, if you're trying to play up the bond between these characters that they're finding as they're going through these experiences together, why wouldn't you go for it straight up mouth to mouth? That's the thing is you could have even gone further with the whole ecstasy sequences. Of yeah. Go orgy. I mean, even if you're not going to go yeah. full orgy, at least that type of imagery, that ev evocation of this entire group gradually just enmeshing. Yeah. Instead of just, you know, those two characters have a relationship, those two characters have a relationship. Mm -hmm. The drug angle of it, the high angle of it was interesting, but they didn't go far enough with it. And by the midpoint of the movie, it's just gone into the ghost movie territory. Yeah. Instead of continuing to play on the whole terror of the crashes, then leading you to want to get additional highs. Yeah. That could have been really fascinating to continue to explore. Oh, yeah. So, original screenplay by Ben Ripley. Basic framework is the same. So, the major changes are the Courtney character doesn't have a tragic backstory. Oh. Hmm. She is someone who's just a neuroscientist who's just really deeply fascinated with, they call it the God spot. She's managed to doing studies of near-death experiences where a lot of people have this light scarring in a specific part of the brain due to it experiencing a sudden burst of stimulation as they die. 
her idea for the experiment is to use a magnetic pulse to stimulate that part of her brain in order to try to simulate the experience of a near-death experience. Oh, okay. And her suddenly flatlining on the table when she does that is an unforeseen side effect. She did not expect that to happen. Oh. And so she just wanted to stimulate the experience. And that's how she pulls in these other students of just, hey, this will be interesting. We'll do this. It'll take five minutes. You know, let's just chart it. You know, monitor my brain activity. I'll tell you what the experience is like. You know, they're like, okay, fine. We'll do it. And they turn on the pulse. She crashes. <laughs> and it's suddenly like, a, oh, shit, what did we just get into type of moment. The big twist in the middle point of the movie is, again, you know, they have the whole ecstasy. They have this whole, basically, our brain is supercharged. It's not like Limitless, where it's like all of our brain is activated at once. It's just, you know, we had this whole rush through our life's experiences. We just feel kind of jazzed and energized. Again, it's very much like a high. Mm -hmm. The midpoint of the movie, they find Courtney dead of a brain embolism. Wow. Hmm. And they discover... This is also when they're starting to find these things that tie into their past where the God spot is right up against the point of the brain that deals with guilt. <laughs> okay. And because the God spot has been stimulated, that has also stimulated the guilt thing. And because those things are both stimulated right up against each other, I don't know the science mm -hmm. of this, but yeah. at least story-wise, <laughs> that's starting to cause inflammation in their brains and they have to figure out a solution before they die. Huh. Oh. So completely not supernatural <gasps> at all. Right. There's no supernatural thing. And it's literally, we need to solve the thing that we're guilty about in order to settle that part of our brain so that our brain will not burst. Huh. I like it. And it actually works out really well. And what I like is it's almost an Inception thing where they play on, you know, the original film had that whole thing of like, I'm going to go in two minutes. I'm going to go in two minutes, 30. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they find out that the longer you stay under, you open up a new layer of experience. Hmm. Like the first layer is you have this hallucinatory fantasy. Like one of them has a whole on like 300 warrior battle type fantasy. <laughs> one of them has, again, like the rushing through the ceiling and all that stuff. That's the first stage. The second stage is your life flashing before your eyes. Mm -hmm. The second stage is the vision of where your life could go. And then the next stage is what's holding you back. Huh. Hmm. And that's where they start to uncover the clues of here's everything that led to who I am. Here's who I hope to be. Here's what might keep me from ever being that. Hmm. And that's what unlocks their guilt. And that's where it's more of a puzzle thing. It's not so much that they're being haunted by things, but it's like their brain is giving them these hints and these clues to things that they need to figure out and sort out in their life, their unfinished business. Jamie's is basically the same. You don't have the whole ghost images, but it's dealing with this woman that he abandoned and having to confront mm. her. Marlowe's is basically the same plot, but when she's in the pool and she sees murderer on the bottom, mm -hmm. instead she just sees a series of numbers and she gradually, as she's trying to dig into and solve what the meaning of those numbers are, she finds out that was the patient ID number. Yeah, oh, okay. So she has to confront that. But again, it's like she doesn't have a supernatural moment where she confronts a ghost. Mm -hmm. Her confrontation is going to the dean and telling what she did. Mm -hmm. That's her settling yeah. it. Sophie's character, who in the script is an Indian woman, who I can't remember what her actual name was, but it was a much more traditional Indian ethnic name. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Her backstory was with her mom. Okay. As a child, she was playing with some jewelry that she found in her dad's desk and showed it to her mom. And it was jewelry inscribed to another woman. Mm. Oh. And that entirely tore apart the family marriage which she blames herself for, and that's why she's never stood up to her mother, because she feels guilty for having ruined her mother's marriage. Hmm. When really... <laughs> <laughs> that's coming from the, my point of a child, and that's her having yeah, to come to terms with it was her father who ruined the marriage. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. There's lots of different changes here and there in terms of how they explore it. There's moments where the hallucinations are very much like the cell, where it just goes full on, over the top, bizarro, grandiose. But there's other ones mm -hmm. where it's like reality will suddenly start shifting around them. And it kind of reminded me of like the scene in the original where they're in the bathroom and the walls suddenly started spreading apart. And it's like the scene oh, yeah. that they are mm -hmm. in will suddenly fold into another scene from their memory. Mm -hmm. There's ways that I could see like a director with a really good hand at set design doing some interesting stuff with. Mm -hmm. I keep thinking of the director of Beyond the Black Rainbow and Mandy. Mm -hmm for something like that. I'd like to see something like that. 
what's interesting is the Ray character, the Diego Luna character, he's someone who's very much a loner. He doesn't talk to any, he doesn't interact with any of the people. And in fact, him getting pulled into the situation is almost just as much of an accident as Marlowe. He's this guy who everyone just kind of has these imagined theories about his backstory. And, you know, it's like, yeah, he's a drug runner who's escaping from the law. He's just all these imagined things. And then Mm -hmm. it gradually have that reveal. He was a firefighter. Yeah. Okay. So the big climax of the movie, this is where I think the script went just one step too far, but it was still interesting, was where Marlo is flatlining. It's been four minutes. He's like, flatline me, line up the pulse. I can enter her Mm. flatline and pull her out. Yeah, that's silly. They took one jump too far. But even then, the actual sequence of him entering her fear was interesting in that as he's pulling her out of that nightmare, and again, her nightmare was literally everything that she had accomplished being meaningless. <laughs> when he goes in and pulls her out of that nightmare, they then have to pass through his, which is as a firefighter, he had to leave another firefighter behind in order to save his own life. Oh. <laughs> And he's able to just walk right through it. And she asks, why doesn't this haunt you? And he said, because I already confronted it every day of my life. And that's why I'm a doctor. Hmm. I think it was a really solid draft of a script. It had a few things that I think needed to just be worked on, tweaked here and there. They could have found some better device to at least make that work or just abandon it altogether. Right. But for the most part, it was a good script. It was definitely a script written by the guy who wrote Source Code. Nice. And unfortunately, again, he's the only credited writer on the finished film because of the way the Hollywood writer system works. (laughs) And very little of this film, even the dialogue, most of this dialogue is not what was in that script. Hmm. Man, I wonder how many people, if this little is left of his original script... There must have been tons of people that touched what finally got made. Yeah. And you never know. He might have been involved in some of the retooling himself. It might have just been the director did it. You never know, because usually you can find, like, so-and-so writer is doing another draft of so-and-so. You can usually find news reports in the in the writer circles. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I found nothing. Nah. It's like, we have this script, and then we have the finished film, and obviously some kind of journey happened along the way. We don't know what. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's, like, no real behind-the-scenes anything. Like, the DVD I had had, like, two little three-minute featurettes were just basically promotional internet featurettes. Mm-hmm. There's, like, no commentary. There's no documentary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there is nothing on that DVD. Although you can watch it in Thai. Yes, you there can. There are so many languages on that DVD. Hmm. I was very impressed. Sony does that. <laughs> Sony makes discs that you can pretty much just drop anywhere in the world and someone can watch them. Yeah. The thing about Flatliners is, I think I'm correct in saying we all prefer the original. Yeah. yeah. But here's a question. Melissa, we'll start with you. Is this a story that you would be curious to see other people try to retell? Yeah. If there was a third remake in a few years, I'd be in to see what would happen with it. Or if somebody said, I want to make what was originally written in this script and make it as its own movie, yeah, I'd be on board for it. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a strong enough concept that it's worth being explored in various different ways. Yeah, and okay, so one thing that I mentioned discussing the original was it would be interesting to see someone do a more serious science fiction approach to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I found out there's this novel that came out about 15 years ago by Connie Willis, one of the legendary science fiction writers, won tons of awards over the years. She wrote a book called Passages. It's about a neuroscientist who studies near-death experiences and learns how to simulate them Mm -hmm. and figures out how they actually work in the brain, how to simulate them, and then it keeps evolving from there. I picked up a copy of the book. I really want to read it. It sounds very much like Brainstorm, Mm -hmm. where it's like, we figured out this piece of science. Let's see how all these stages that we can keep exploring it further and further and further. So that exists out there. I think it would be cool to check out. But I would also like to see, again, more horror movies where the horror is literally just a person dealing with their own issues. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think that's the strongest thing about Flatliners is that whether it's scientific gobbledygook or not, the central theme is dealing with guilt and making things right. And Mm -hmm. this sort of stuff is always relevant and it's especially relevant right now. I think it's a great theme to work on, and that's something that's perennial. And I think that's why it's always interesting when we get something like Babadook, when we get something like Hereditary, Mm -hmm. where it's like, it's not about gore, it's not about the monster, it's about the person. And this is Mm -hmm. literally the issues that this person is suffering through. Mm -hmm. And I want more horror stories that just do that. 
in Flatliners, the monster isn't the kid that's attacking you. It's what you did to that kid in the first place. And I think the lack of understanding of that is ultimately what brought down this remake. And it's also just, yeah. it feels like, again, it's too many people wanted to do too many different things with it. And it ultimately ends up doing not much. Yeah. Yeah. I hate it when movies do that. <laughs> and apparently Michael Douglas still produced this one, so. <laughs> okay. Sure. Why not? Yeah. Mike, he used to make good ones. <laughs> well, you can't call them all. <laughs> yeah. So, box office release. Flatliners came out on the weekend of September 29th, 2017. Number one at the theaters in its second week of release was Kingsman the Golden Circle. Okay. At number two in its fourth week was still It. Mm -hmm. And at number four was the Lego Ninjago movie. This was when American Maid opened at number three and Flatliners decently opened at number five. Oh, okay. okay. Where it made a total weekend gross of $6 million. In its second week, Flatliners is already down to number nine. Yeah. Mm. Ouch. And that's when Blade Runner 2049 opened at number one. Yeah. Okay. The Mountain Between Us opened at number two. I keep forgetting about that movie. It actually looked charming. It's the one with Idris Elba and Kate Winslet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then My Little Pony, the movie, opened at number four. <laughs> Flatliners was booted down by My Little Pony. <laughs> In its third week of release, Flatliners is already at number 12. Oh. And that's when Happy Death Day opened at number one. <laughs> of all things. In its fourth week, and we'll probably stop here soon, Flatliners is already down to number 21. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. It just did not have any legs at all. And that's when Tyler Perry's Boo 2, a Medea Halloween, <laughs> opened at number one. <laughs> <laughs> and opening at number two... Geostorm. Oh my god. And opening at number eight, The Snowman. <laughs> Talk about the worst Halloween weekend. This was last year and I don't I even know. remember any of these movies. I like The Foreigner has been like holding in the mid top tens. It is still in the top ten. Mm. Kingsman is still number ten. So it's like some of these movies did pretty decently. But mm. yeah, Flatliners and let's see what its total box office was. It made $16 million. Wow. Well, what was its budget? $19 million. Mm. Ow. I don't really know why this had to be a theatrical film. Given that by 2017, we were already having films released to streaming services. Mm -hmm. Part of it might mm -hmm. just be that Sony, like Crackle, has never really taken off for Sony, so they didn't really have any deep mm -hmm. ties to any streaming services. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could see like a Flatliners, honestly, a TV series would be interesting as if you take the basic setup, basically make the original story its first season, and then try to evolve that even further in subsequent seasons. You could make an interesting show out of it. Or heck, just like a Netflix miniseries, like five episodes. And it's almost like Lost, where you focus on one character per episode yeah. and progress the plot along the way. Flatliners is one of those concepts that I would like to see someone explore the next step. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what's the next step? Be Again, like kind of getting back to Brainstorm is like, how does this continue to grow? As both a mm -hmm. technique, as both an understanding, as an experience, as, you know, what happens when a flatline goes wrong, you know? That was, again, I think the big thing that the original film never really dealt with is what happens when the death isn't undone. Mm -hmm. Or what happens when somebody gets wind of the high you get after doing this process and it goes underground and like all the rave circles and they have like <laughs> underground flatliner yes. clinics and how did the main characters fight it? And wouldn't that be interesting? <laughs> Even if the main characters are the ones fighting it, just kind of explore that on a societal whole. Like, what if this becomes known? Mm -hmm. Again, like, what if their experiences and their research goes public and they not only have to deal with all the legal issues of what the fuck are you doing with you know, university resources, but also genuine scientific interest in what their research has resulted in. Right. Yeah. It's going to be that whole conflict of getting back to the Nazi experiments of we learned a lot of really interesting stuff from that, but we learned it through very terrible ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, that whole conflict of advance of knowledge. Mm -hmm. We've learned something new. At what cost? And that could be your entire premise is we found something new at what cost? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically what Black Mirror the TV series is. <laughs> And that just and, reiterates, yeah. I need to watch yeah. Black Mirror. That's where you can have this whole broader, more sprawling societal story dealing with the scientists, dealing with, again, this whole underground movement of kids flatlining themselves. 
also playing out these individual stories of people who now have to like go through these very personal individual experiences as a result of going through this. And you can even go outside the, now that this main research has gone public, here's other scientists who are trying it. Here's other people who are, you, it's I'm like a strange days. It's like this technology yeah. has hit the streets. Here's how all these people are using it and all the personal experiences and personal stories that come as a result of it. You can go really expansive and still have these really interesting dream stories. Mm -hmm. It's such an interesting thing. You could do both the theatrical, supernatural morality play as well as a broader societal science fiction story at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. God, this is, could be like a really interesting five-year series, you know? Write it, Noel. <laughs> With what time? <laughs> I, I don't know. You can take some time off a podcast. It's got to equal about the same amount of time. <laughs> I'd say you have it half written already. We'll see what happens with the office pool on the Powerball. Okay, awesome. <laughs> So I, I actually did throw out a question around Twitter or just ask people, so have you seen Flatliners? What did you think of it? Have you seen the remake? And I got a few responses. And I just wanted to read them real quick here. Ooh. Tom, aka Body Snatcher 77 said, saw it new in theaters and didn't love or hate it. I enjoyed its gothic atmosphere, but felt the concept needed a villain or monster other than their past sins. Haven't seen the remake. Mm. I don't think we agree with you, Tom. No, we don't. <laughs> That's Okay. <laughs> Though you might like the remake as it involves demonic forces. Demonic forces. <laughs> Potentially. <laughs> Tim, the co-host of Cinema Spection, a great podcast that I really enjoy. He said, haven't seen the remake. I think I saw the original once it hit cable. I thought it was a great concept with some weird stylish visuals, but kept wishing they had done more with the idea. It felt like there was a hesitation to be an out and out horror film. And more Oliver Platt, damn it. <laughs> yeah. I think we all agree with you, Tim. <laughs> yes. More Oliver Platt in all things. Again, I don't know that it needed to be out and out horror because the yeah. original had enough intensity to it. And again, I like how everyone's visions were very different. Right. Oh, yeah. You had some were very horror, some were very suspense, like what's in the bathroom. And again, like the William Baldwin one, it's not even scary. It's uncomfortable. Yes. Well, I think that might be just veering into matter of taste. You know, some people yeah. like mm -hmm. more chocolate than peanut butter. Some people like more peanut butter than chocolate. Yep. What I like about Joel is he kind of lets... Everything feels like it's the same movie, but he lets each sequence kind of do its own thing. Oh, yeah. And you mm -hmm. see this a lot in Lost Boys, too, where it's like, there's a lot of segments in Lost Boys that you could basically make into a music video, but each one is a very different music video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he lets each scene kind of have its own vibe, its own breath, its own style. And again, that's what I liked about this movie was there's not a sameness to everything. There's a lot of variety, mm -hmm. whereas the remake, it's all very same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Charles of The Last Hometown, which is both a podcast and a webcomic, said, I saw the 1990 version opening day at the Village 4 Theater in Coon Rapids. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Loved it. Kiefer Sutherland has always been a favorite of mine, and there's very little I do not like from him. Never seen the remake. Need to find time to. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Scott, a.k.a. Scott Pocalypse, said, Tried to rent the original last year but didn't have any luck, though I didn't try super hard. Ended up watching the 2017 one anyways and definitely found it underwhelming. Also found it funny, maybe a little distracting, because I used to frequent a few of the locations they used. I should point out he lives in <laughs> Toronto. Yes, he is Canadian. And then Rebecca Nicole Williams, a.k.a. Sorceress of Film, I really want to give her a shout out. She's in the UK. She's a curator of revival screenings. Between our recording the original and our recording of this one, she did a 70 millimeter print of the original hmm. Flatliners. <gasps> Yay. She screened that at the PH Science and Media Museum in Bradford, England. We've connected online. She's been really fun to chat with. She's been doing a whole bunch of revival screenings of Joel Schumacher films. Oh, okay. She's on Lost Boys, Falling Down. She's got a screening of Sparkle, which is the first time Sparkle has ever been screened in a theater in the UK. Hmm. Wow. She's got Phone Booth coming up. By the way, I highly recommend anyone who's interested, go to her Twitter page, Sorceress of Film, where she'll have a lot of information about all of her upcoming screenings. Hmm. She said this of the Flatliner screening. It was very well received tonight, stood up really, really well, and the 70 millimeter print, quite possibly the best condition of any print I've ever shown, was a great night. <gasps> oh, 70 millimeter Jan de Bont. Oh. As a fan of original <laughs> prints, I figured you would appreciate that, Melissa. Oh, and I'm a sucker for 70 millimeter. I'm such mm. a sucker for it. So is it any final thoughts about Flatliners overall? Watch the original, definitely. This one, not so much. 
Yeah, it's a really great concept. Occasionally has some flaws. I think the original pulls it off a little better than the remake. Jack had mentioned to me while I was watching it, I don't know if he looked at Rotten Tomatoes or what, but something he said it had a rating of 4%. <gasps> I don't think that's fair. The remake, fair. The the... remake. Yeah, I don't think that's fair. 4% is way too harsh. It's not that bad. But you have to remember that Rotten Tomatoes will count an indifferent review as negative. Yeah, yeah there's no in between. And I think it's a film that right. had a lot of midline indifferent reviews. Right. Yeah. I guess my point is if you see that rating somewhere, it's not that bad a movie. Don't yeah. take it on that. But it is pretty flawed, so it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not a movie that's worth going out of your way to see. Yeah. But it's a film that I think if you come across it, yeah, check it out. It's interesting. Especially if you have seen the original, I think it's interesting to see a different take on it. Mm -hmm. But the original is one of those ones that I absolutely recommend people check out. I have my problems with the original, but it's still so well made. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's a premise that I don't think either one fully nails, mm -hmm. but the original still just does such interesting and gripping and absorbing things with it. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen like Joel Schumacher have this kind of evolution of his style. I think it is the most visually powerful movie we've seen on Schumacast so far. Yeah. In terms of design, the camera work, the music, the lighting, mm -hmm. it's so absorbing. I think that wraps up our episode. I think yeah. so. We sure have talked a long time about a movie we don't like very much. <laughs> right? We had a lot of things to say about what we didn't like. We're good at that. Yes, we did. <laughs> it's going to be interesting to see how this all cuts down. Yeah. But thank you again for joining us, Melissa. Yes, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. And again, where can people find you? Oh, I'm here, I'm there, I'm around the web in places. I do real education at realedu.com. That's R-E-E-L-E-D-U.com. Mm -hmm. Real Education Noir is also a thing I do. It's currently kind of on hiatus. And that is at realedunoir.com. And there's some other stuff. It, <laughs> I, I'm around. <laughs> Good night, Angie. Good night. Good night. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot dot com. Shumacast can also be found on Stitcher. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Shumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended.